Okay. Ooh. Ooh. All right. Welcome, everybody. <laughs> I'm going to open the um, FY20 budget hearing, Shelby Regional School District budget hearing, um, and then um, calling that to order at 6 o'clock. And then once um, we get through um, the budget hearing, um, we'll go into our regular open meeting. Um, so what is a budget hearing? It's, um, it's an opportunity for the school district and community to understand and hear and ask questions about the budget. Um, the superintendent will present it, so let's let her get through the uh, presentation. And then once she's had a chance to do that, we'll take any and all questions from anybody in the community that has any. Um, and I think that's it. Great, thank you. So we're going to start um, just going through some of the basic things. It's not, it's not showing up very great tonight, I don't know is why it? It's not Oops. Yeah. I'm not sure how it's televising either. I'm just going to start. <laughs> we're yeah, yeah, that's it. Perfect. Yeah, but you have to keep on plugging it and plugging it back in. Again. Oh, really? Oh, that's. Oh. Mm -hmm. So I, I'll, I'll go through this quickly because I know that um, most everyone around the table has already seen all of this information, so there's nothing new to bring to you right at this point in time. So I'm just going to go through it quickly. Our goal always, the budget that the, the Neshoba Regional School District seeks to continue to provide outstanding educational and instructional delivery within responsible fiscal parameters. The considerations that we uh, consistently keep at the forefront is that we, we try very hard to provide level services where possible. Uh, K through 12. Um, this year I think we did a really good job of that. The contractual obligations, I think sometimes that gets lost in the shuffle, but that takes up more than uh, the fair share of the budget is just our contractual obligations. The uh, different unions, the, the different contracts that we've got, uh, got out there, that takes up about 80% of, of our total budget. Um, continued initiative implementation, for example, the literacy uh, um, initiative that we started a couple of years ago. We're in year four now of five years. We want to see that through to fruition. So that, for example, is one that we would, uh, we would consider. Staffing recommendations, of course, the principals put forward. You've already seen that, but you also know that we've cut away a lot of that as well. Um, moving forward, the stakeholder involvement, of course, school committee is heavily involved. Our district administration is heavily involved. And we talk, of course, with the town administrators on a regular basis, depending on uh, where we're at in the process. Um, we start that kind of talk, to be honest with you, with the town administrators in December, uh, when your first number is being ready. To, so that they're involved right throughout. Um, this year, Paul and Don and I have had more communication back and forth than we would normally have during the season. But Bolton was in a different position this year than, than other districts last year. I had more contact with Orlando. Uh, so just it just really kind of depends. <coughs> Our budget um, in FY19 was the 54 million, FY20 the 55.8. Right now it sits uh, at, at basically an increase of 3.31 percent. Keep in mind though, over the page when you take a look at the assessments, even though our budget might be three point something percent, that's not how it works in terms of the communities. And I just want to mention a couple of quick things here again. Um, the assessment numbers are not something that the school district comes up with. Those are numbers that we receive from the state. We generally get them through the charity sheets and uh, we plug those in. And then of course the sheet that we have here is formulaically driven as well. So we plug those numbers in. This year Bolton saw a bit of an uptick. If you were to, to uh, go on to um, the uh, DESE website, there's some, some data in there that you, you can see as to why. And one of the key reasons why Colton was higher this year is because their income um, level was actually higher this year. Stoves went down a little bit and Bolton's went up substantially and that was one of the reasons why there's the large differential now for, for Bolton, which has created a bit of a different issue for Bolton. So the assessments right now, as they stand tonight, are sitting at 4.99 for Bolton, Lancaster is at 3.31, mm -hmm. Stowe is minus 0 0.01. Uh, so that's where it sits as of tonight. Now I would tell you, um, and I've shared this already with the chair, that we will probably still do a little bit of tweaking uh, between now and the final year final meeting. 
So I don't expect it to be a percent or anything like that, but I still suspect that we've got uh, probably around 100,000 or so, somewhere in there that we're still looking at, uh, that we've just identified as unidentified cuts right now. Not cut cuts, but just changes that we're going to make to the, the overall ask. Finally, as we just move into the priorities, the superintendent's budget priorities, the continuing priorities for the safety, that's, uh, you hear me talk about that all the time, that's going to continue forward next year. The early literacy is we start to wrap that project up. The science standards, you're gonna hear about STEM scopes tonight. The math, the ongoing textbook and coursework implementation and the unit building that's continuing to work with that. Social studies, there's a brand new review that's out, so you're gonna see that probably start to um, uh, come up probably for the next t at least two years as in supporting of the uh, changes that have been made with the frameworks at the state level, so we'll be having to make curriculum changes here. There's a continued focus for us on the academic support district-wide. We can't lose sight of the um, SOI resubmission. Mm -hmm. Facilities, you know that we all we have ongoing efforts district wide with our facilities. Social emotional learning initiatives, you're going to see us play that out more over the next two years. You know that this year we had more of a technology focus. The next two years, you're going to see us take more of a place more of a focus on social emotional learning initiatives. That's going to include training for staff, training for administrators, and uh, we're excited about the work moving forward in that area. What we have still included as of tonight, but I, I say this will still, we will potentially still see some changes here. At NRHS right now, <coughs> still the business teacher to increase to the, uh, the point eight to the one FTE, the science teacher change, the dean of students still is in there at center school, the intervention based at instructional assistant at K to one is still in there. At Hale School, I mentioned to you last time that I thought I'd probably end up putting that assistant principal position back in. So tonight it's in there as well, as well as the literacy specialist, the health services, the nurse at NRHS and the floating nurse. Remember I said that those were non-negotiables because um, the, we, ha we have to have that. Special education, we have to have that. The technology support is still in there for the request that they have as well. So that's a broad um, overview. You've seen a lot of the details, but tonight is really to give the broad overview and, and that's kind of where we've landed as of tonight. This is the opportunity for the public to ask questions if there are any further questions from the public. We'll be doing, the school committee itself, remember, we'll be doing a budget section tonight and we'll give you the update. So you'll have plenty of time for the school committee to have um, additional discussion tonight. Do we have any questions from the community? Any comments? Colin, you got anything? No. <laughs> All right, then with that, we'll, um, I need someone to close the FY20 <coughs> public budget hearing. I move to close the FY20 <coughs> public budget hearing. I'm calling that to, um, at 6.08. Thank you. Linda, thank you, by the way. All right, so now we're going to open our um, open meeting, our public meeting, the G February 27, 2019 regular. Right. You know what? Oh, I need to do a uh, roll call. So, no. I need a second. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm okay. just kind of ru running through this. <laughs> um, all those in favor? <laughs> okay. Lynn, are you with us? Oh, yeah, sorry. Okay. Elise yeah. seconded. Elise oh, yeah. seconded. Second. Second. Right, yeah. We're all set. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Uh, regular school committee meeting opening at 6.09. Okay. Um, do we have any citizens' comments for any of the agenda items on the agenda tonight? I have a couple of questions. Uh, for the budget? Yes. Oh. <coughs> it's, it's okay. uh, why don't you use your citizens' comments to make a statement, and then when we get to the budget portion, maybe we can, maybe it will be addressed in some of the discussion points. Okay. Does that make sense? So frame, frame it as a comment? Just whatever you okay. want to say. It's your three <coughs> minutes. Have at it. Okay, all right. Um, I just had, so just a couple questions, like I said. Oh, what's your name? Elizabeth, what's my name? Is that what she said? Elizabeth yeah. Davis Edwards. In Bolton. In Bolton. <laughs> Tonight's one of those nights. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So, um, so the questions that I have are first, um, I'm curious as to um, why we're asking for three 
assistant administrators to the principal when you've always had two. And what the reasoning is, be, is behind that, I'm assuming we'll be getting to that anyway. And the second question is whether or not um, costs for litigation have increased and they're increasing this year, and if so, how much and why? Good question. Okay, um, thank you, Ms. Edwards. Um, and I hope you stay with us. I will be here till seven. <laughs> till seven? Okay, let's move. We might, we might be uh, okay, let's move. Um, I only have one um, update for, are there any other citizens' comments? I didn't think so, but that was a good one. Um, the, to the policy uh, personnel subcommittee, um, could you get the superintendent's evaluation started sooner, like as soon as the budget is over because the current sitting committee really should provide the evaluation? So originally we had identified um, April 10th as the workshop for helping get started with it. Do you want it at the last meeting in March? No, because I'm traveling. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so April, well, you can do it without me, and then you get to put it all together. No, but the, when I looked at last year's time frame, it's, it's approximately the same. So the idea is that we give people the information on the 10th. Dorothy may or may not be able to do a workshop on the 10th, but I'm comfortable doing a workshop to get folks started. And then last year we gave people two weeks, two weeks to submit their um, reports to you and then I think I did it in a week. Yeah, so we can work on that timeline, but we can adjust it I, I can be prepared to adjust it. We have a PSC meeting coming up on Wednesday um, We're still working on some documents for the um, scoping manual But just let me know what you want to do and we'll make it work. So why don't we talk to the group, but thanks, that's great. Okay. So Alita, what, can you tell me when our meeting is in, I don't have the calendar in front of me, in May? Uh, May is the 8th, and then the 22nd will be a new committee. So we have to have it done by the 8th. And that should work. It could work, a couple of ideas. If you want to put the workshop before the, the March 27th meeting, that would give people a little bit more time. It would That's good, you yeah. would have to um, <coughs> give us your self evaluation by then. Mm -hmm. um, but I could set up all the documents, and so if we could schedule an evaluation workshop from five to six on the twenty seventh, and awesome. and then work from that. The other thing, and I know that this happens in some towns, if for whatever reason the schedule gets messed up, then um, the, the the people that have contributed to the evaluation come back to the meeting where the evaluation is put. So there's just a couple of options if you want to mm -hmm. consider them. That's it. Let me know what you want to do. I think, if, I think if we had two weeks for everyone from the time that they do there, because two weeks is more than enough. And right. it's a pretty and easy system to we, get We've through. refined it so that it's, yeah. it's more focused. Yeah, yeah. That, that'll work. So, okay. okay, I so just wanted to make sure that it, we, we're, we're all on the same page. So we're going to do an are. eval workshop on 327 from 5 to 6. Yep, that sounds good. Okay. Is everybody good with that? Okay. You're going to run that? Yes. Yeah, perfect. Okay, thank you. That's all I have. Student representative report. Mr. Delisle. Sorry, I can't get it. Sorry. Thank you. All right, so we'll start off with sports as usual. <laughs> Neshoba Athletics have shown some great success over the winter season for many of our teams. Our girls basketball team finished the regular season with a record of 17 and three and is pushing through playoffs now with their quarterfinal game against Medfield tomorrow night at Neshoba. The boys JV hockey team unfortunately lost their championship game but had a great season leading up to it. Many of Neshoba's swimmers did well at the all-state meet where several school records were broken. We also had one runner, Alexandra Batez, who qualified for all states in the 1,000 meter indoor track event. She finished 12th place overall. Uh, Brevin Casella came in first place at his, in his division at the all-state wrestling meet last weekend. 
Neshoba will soon be hosting its annual intramural vo volleyball tournament, sorry, sponsored by the girls' volleyball team and Relay for Life. Students and teachers will make teams and compete in the week-long competition to see who comes out on top. For arts, the spring musical is almost here. Performances for Mary Poppins start on March 15th, and they run uh, that Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. The band and choir students recently returned from their Disney trip, where they performed at they performed at the park, took part in interactive music and movie activities, and of course, went on all the rides. The high school jazz bands will be performing at the MAJE Jazz Competition next Wednesday, March 6th. For upcoming events, the Shoba DECA teams will be competing in the state's competition in Boston from March 7th to March 9th. Here they will present their business-related projects to real business professionals who will determine whether they move on to the national competition in Orlando, Florida. And Neshoba's EMTs have been working hard on their upcoming blood drive at the high school on March 14th. They hope to raise money from the blood donations for their EMT scholarships through the Red Cross. That's what I have. Are you good? Any questions for Colin? No? Are you done skiing for the year? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, thanks, Colin. Appreciate that. Um, superintendent's report, please. Yeah, I'm just gonna. I've got a couple quickly to to go over, and then uh, our assistant superintendent with water will go through a couple. Budget meetings for us continue. Um, at this time of year, we're we're constantly in budget um, cycle all through just about every day. <laughs> From morning to night, we're, we're meeting about it, tweaking it, and trying to get it to where we think it should be. We're also starting to meet with our towns. Last night, we were at Bolton. Bolton was fabulous. They, I, I, I was really, really pleased with the questions that they asked last night. It was great. Um, we'll be meeting with both Stowe and Lancaster in the next week, so uh, just so that that's out there, that you're aware of that. Um, generally, we, we meet with the FinCon, but I think that we've got a Lancaster, no, I think we've got a Stowe meeting as well for the Board of Selectmen. So I'm not, I'm not I sure. Don't about, I don't know about the pin call. Okay. Next Tuesday. We'll just do a quick check on that. So, um, so uh, just let you know that we're going around and having those meetings. And this year, I'd like to go to Lancaster as well. So, um, Aspect Valley Collaborative, just uh, the annual audit. I think it, it was included in your package. So I just wanted to point that out for you. Um, March 21st at 6:30. Uh, we've talked about this before. Uh, Ruth Potter, Potter, is that her name? Is a very well-known physician is going to be coming in and doing um, a parent, a student and parent session because really students are invited to attend as well. We've got some, and we're offering these to you tonight as well, so that you can hopefully join us as well that evening. Um, it's a night to talk. Uh, it's entitled a, a community conversation uh, about opioids, our uh, our drugs, and youth in general. I'm sure, vaping will come up in, at that point in time as well. So. Feel free to take a quick peek at that, and, and feel free to attend that evening if you if you have the availability. That's been planned for quite a few months, so we're really excited about that that night. And I'll turn it over to the talk. Sure. In addition, uh, in terms of outreach, we're also offering the district is also offering two mental health awareness first aid programming for members of our community. If you recall, we. Um, identified that we've done a lot of training with our administration and our teachers in the district uh, before we started the school year. So a lot of our administration have had this training. Um, we're gonna be offering this training to members of the community, two sessions that'll take place from 8.30 to 12.30 on Saturday, April 27th, and Saturday, uh, May 4th, 2019 in the Neshoba Regional High School Media Center. Um, for more information, you can check out the web pages. We will have um, a flyer on the mental health first aid on all of our web pages. And we also have um, two instructors that are in the district, um, Diana Durr and Katie Abrazese, who uh, work at our high school, who will be offering the training to community members. And there's another flyer going around on that one as well. How do we get this information out to parents? It's all, it, it, we just said it's on the, our website as well, and it, it, all the principals are posting oh, it as well. Good. Yeah. So yeah, awesome. I think that I think it's gotten quite a bit of. Um, yeah. Do you put it in the? Do you folks put it in your newsletters? Awesome. Thanks. And how are you presenting this? I mean, they're presenting it. I, I, I know that, but I mean, if 
you don't have to have a youth with mental health issues or drug addictions to go to this. No, no. Nope. And so these are just for the community to recognize it and understand what they're looking at. It's like an education and in inform information sessions is really what it is. But everything that we've seen from Emerson and everything has all said that these are all community issues. And that's why they're getting the, pa that's why they're letting the parents know. Right. But this is almost like SPED. I mean, SPED is for everybody also. I mean, it isn't just for SPED people or SPED kids. No, it's for anyone who's a kind of risk. Right. And so who yeah. should take it? Read the who should take it. Parents, people who work with youth, anybody who wants to come can come. <coughs> what are you looking for? Attendance. What are you looking for about attendance? Are you looking for? Well, there's almost a stigma, like when, with SPED. I mean, SPED is some really wonderful programs that can be put towards anything and anybody. It doesn't matter what level they're at or whatever. But nobody goes because or the turnout isn't oh, as great as it should be because of the title. And I I'm just wondering if there's another way to, to frame this to let people know that this is a community problem and a community issue and we're not saying that you have this problem, but so, you should recognize so it. So maybe here's here's something and maybe this will help. Um, I'm gonna do I'm gonna break rank here and needle do you think you guys could put an announcement in the paper about um, this? Yeah, yes, it's on the flyer electronically. You know what? Start there, I'm sorry Can you hand down. these both to yeah, just give them. her those? I can put it at least in the calendar. I'm going to talk to Cindy about if a story. If you would, that yeah. would be really great. But I can't guarantee anything. We yeah. don't know what the schedule Better. is. Well, it's a start, and I think I mean, nobody's saying you can't come if you don't have a child in the district. No, right? and, I, and I get that. But this, the, like I said, based on past, there's like a little stigma, and it's like, no, it's, everybody should go. This, this should be a huge turnout. These are, I'm glad you're doing it. Yeah. I'm excited about both of them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just real quick, the first program, I don't know if you mentioned this, no. does, do, wh where is that going to be held? Because on the flyer, it just says the Michelle Regional School District. It's held at the high school. At the high school. school. Okay. Yes, at the high school, March 21st at 6.30 p.m. Mm -hmm. Oh, the address, okay, yeah, okay. Actually, that, that's good. That's good. Okay, and I think he had one more. Yep, two more. Thank you. Um, <laughs> we also wanted to highlight um, this year the work that in the um, collaboration between the Department of Teaching and Learning Technology and our building principals. Um, this year, the Department of Teaching and Learning has uh, been implementing monthly meetings with all building principals as well as our technology department to work on communicating collaborating together on professional development, assessment practices, and finding common consistent communication with the greater Neshoba community. These meetings have allowed for a free flow of ideas amongst all of our schools, constructive feedback, and a collaborative approach to all of the teaching and learning strategies that are being implemented across the district. All of our building principals have been uh, attending uh, the Department of Teaching and Learning, Martina Kenyon, Cindy Larson, our technology department, myself, uh, are attending these monthly meetings that are focused on improving cross-district communication and creating the consistent uh, expectations and experiences for teachers and students. So these monthly meetings have really kind of just increased that communication piece, the collaboration amongst all of our, our schools, as well as the consistency as it relates to professional development and the new initiatives that we're implementing um, across all of our schools. So something that we've started brand new this year, and yeah. it's just working really, really well. Yep. And then finally, um, tomorrow um, marks the second training for the Systemic Student Support Academy. That's the grant that uh, Neshoba earned for uh, social-emotional learning that is aligned with its Safe and Supportive Schools Initiative for supporting social-emotional learning in our schools um, that we earned this past fall. Uh, we were one of eight school districts that was selected to participate. Um, that academy is sponsored and facilitated by the Rennie Center and the Boston College Lynn School of Education Center for Optimized Student Support. Um, they have also been offering several webinars in addition to um, the face-to-face -face, um, workshops, and tomorrow marks day two of that. Um, and that's going to tie into the work that we want to put into our goals for next year um, on social-emotional learning. And I think, and I believe I said this in the phone call conversation, I don't think you can go wrong when you're working with the Rennie Center. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I, I'm really excited that this grant is in play and that this this academy is going to work part of it. Very, very thrilled with that. Thank you, Todd. That's it for us. Good stuff. Lynn. So you won these um, grants for participating, or you won them because of something we're doing? Do you want to explain it or mark it? Yeah, so, so we applied. There was a grant that, that we applied for, and um, 
to show about five for the grant. We were one of eight school districts to, to earn the grant, participate in this social emotional learning training okay. um, for potential um, procedures, policies, programs that we can put and implement into our schools. So we're working with seven and eight, eight other school districts, um, three workshops, professional development workshops, as well as webinars and a variety of resources that will help us find ways to implement social emotional learning programs in our district. So when we're done, we will have some kind of a district policy or some kind of a district? It'll help us create. It'll help us create in, in, with our work. And Martina can, uh, has yeah. just come to the table. She can certainly uh, shed a little bit of light on it as well. Um, but it, but it, it, will, it will help us in terms of our goals for the next two years. You've heard us say mm -hmm. that that's where we're starting. This is kind of gives us a nice foundation for that, that part of our work. Kathy had a question. Yeah, um, next Friday is George Coros, is that correct? March 8th. March 8th, March 8th. so it's a week. Yeah, it's a week. Friday. Friday. Right, um, and I didn't, I'm sorry, I missed the last <coughs> meeting, but I don't know the extent to which it's okay for school committee members. We invited you all last week. Right. Okay, because I have yeah. seen him, I saw him when he was in Midfield. If you folks can go, please go. It is, he's just phenomenal. And um, is a real uh, teacher's teacher and transformational speaker so we've got as I mentioned in the last meeting and I probably didn't put it in this one because I probably sounded like a broken record <laughs> in the last few meetings but we've got 23 showcases several professional development workshops uh, he's speaking and the commissioner is also coming so please we invite all school committee members to join us next next Friday it's going to be a great day it's going to be a great day we've got some ignite <laughs> that are coming along yeah. at, along as well so we've got showcases in the two gyms it should be a really good day <laughs> No, but you, he's, he's going to be the keynote. Yeah, he'll, he'll be there in the morning. morning. First thing in the morning. What yeah. time? 8 o'clock. 8 o'clock. Yeah. Oh, I can do that. Yeah. <laughs> Safety Safety. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you for that, folks. We're going to move into new business um, with a quick overview of the STEM Scopes presentation. Thank you for coming mm -hmm. since yeah. this is on our. Well, did you pull it out? No, we're, we've taken care of it. Good. We've dealt with it. So uh, everybody knows Martina Kenyon, and I think she and Todd have got a nice presentation that they're ready to give us tonight to give you the school committee and our community an overview of what STEM Scopes is all about, how it fits into our curriculum. It's gonna fade out with something. That's okay. <laughs> uh, so thanks very much for the opportunity to come here tonight and speak to you about STEM Scopes. Um, STEM Scopes is the primary uh, curriculum resource that we use at the elementary uh, level and it's part of a number and variety of curriculum resources that we use at the uh, middle school level. And uh, we purchased STEM scopes as part of some broader multi-year work to um, adapt our curriculum to fit the um, expectations of the updated um, science, technology, and engineering standards that were released uh, probably three years ago mm -hmm. now. Uh, this year was the first year we fully implemented STEM scopes. Uh, currently it's uh, in place in the, like I said, the foundational resource to our curriculum maps at elementary, and that's um, where we've uh, purchased the most material and so forth as well to support it. Um, the, the, uh, just to give you a little bit more background on the uh, expectations of the new curriculum that we were trying to address in revising our units and also purchasing this resource, um, one of the major shifts is that the um, updated standards really emphasize this need for students to actively participate in their learning. And we've talked about that before, but even in science, you know, this concept of hands-on, the state um, really emphasizes doing more than that so that students are really um, planning their own learning in terms of what labs they're doing and so forth. Um, on top of that, because we now have so much access to technology, we know that teachers really don't have to deliver information anymore. We have technology, we want students to um, really be able to develop the skill set to create ideas, to analyze information that they're seeing, um, or um, kind of developing through these um, active learning experiences, um, synthesizing them, and we were looking for a resource <coughs> and our curriculum in general to really be able to address and support teachers and students in this area. Um, and just to give a little bit more background, <coughs> this kind of colorful image um, there, uh, also emphasizes one of the big shifts in the updated standards in that uh, we now have a layer called the um, science and engineering practices which are really um, address what students who are learning science should be doing again emphasizing this active participation in learning um, and they overlap um, 
quite readily with other content areas, which as we were looking for a resource <coughs> and developing our curriculum, um, we really wanted to capitalize on the opportunity to integrate the content wherever, poss wherever possible so that students really um, are getting more than just this um, learning of science out of their experience, although that's obviously important as well. Um, so with that said, I did want to tell you a little bit more about what um, supports are available in the resource. It would be nice if we could see it. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Some pictures. But um, Twilight, who's sitting in the TV? Because my computer is fine. It's in the TV. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We'll work with it. Can you um, see it to read it? Do you want us to read it? Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good. I'm pretty good. If I, it's if good. I lose track, it'll be okay. Um, so, uh, obviously, again, in science, we, we're emphasizing this active learning, and um, the resource itself provides structures and um, tasks so that students um, and teachers really can do this work of exploring, of actually demonstrating these practices, like planning an investigation, like building an argument based on evidence, like communicating their ideas um, within these longer-term kind of structured Tasks. Each unit in STEM scopes also um, starts with either like a really interesting question for students or some phenomenon that helps students really um, hopefully see why they might want to learn more about this and how it might apply into their lives uh, to give them a little bit of a sense of connection to the material. Um, beyond the kind of, I'll call it pure, but it's collaborative science experiences, the resource itself also has um, a lot of supports for uh, in the literacy in the area of literacy. First, um, students are either reading articles or looking at different media to actually synthesize what they're learning. So they're experiencing this um, um, sort of active um, exploratory um, work, and then they're reading to solidify their ideas to make sure they get the details that maybe they didn't get the first time when they were actually working with the ideas themselves. Uh, there are many embedded opportunities to also demonstrate um, their learning or share their ideas either in writing or um, in um, speaking either with their peers or presenting to the class, and that's all structured and supported within the unit. Um, so it goes way <coughs> beyond the text. It's like a real resource that um, supports teachers in areas that they might um, not necessarily have experience um, facilitating that in, in, their, in their classes. Um, also, because the learning is um, very collaborative, uh, and the resource provides supports for teachers and students to um, <coughs> do that collaboration, either through structures, um, jobs that kids have when they're collaborating together, um, structures for helping them plan so that they can develop those problem solving, those self-monitoring, those collaborative and discussion skill skills that we want them to uh, get out of every experience. And finally, each unit begins with um, this idea that every student brings something to the table, regardless of your background, your life experience, your learning need. Um, the, the very opening activity is simply like this um, phenomenon that students try to understand and try to contribute and share their ideas for in order to then jump off and um, do um, further collaborative learning. So every student has many opportunities to contribute to the learning of the group and, um, and have a positive impact on their their own learning and that, that of their peers. So then before I finish up, I just wanted to give you two examples of the type of work that students are doing um, within uh, the STEM scopes uh, resource. On the left, you see a collection of um, four projects that were the outcome of a first grade unit on sound. Um, students spent most of the time kind of exploring the idea that sound causes vibration. And um, in the end, they were trying to answer the questions, how do drums and guitars actually make sound? And they built their own instruments. Uh, and then uh, as part of that, connected to the literacy work that the teachers are doing by writing informational how-to books that I have um, a couple of examples of. Uh, and then in one class, they actually um, uh, collaborated with the ITS to create mini videos where they played the instruments, explained how they work, and um, they put them online into a portfolio so that I think parents are also able great to ones. see it. This is first three years. Well, I wonder yeah. if there's going to be a correlation between that and an increase in the number of kids taking band. <laughs> I know. Right? They at least have an instrument. <laughs> well, at least they understand how it works. Yeah. And that you can play too, you know. Right. Yeah, that's great. Uh, and then on the right, on the other um, side in the middle school end, uh, you see students at the very beginning of a learning experience um, as part of a big unit on how um, 
uh, the laws of physics kind of impact uh, humans, and uh, they're just getting into um, learning about non-contact forces. So up till now, they've learned um, about sort of push pulls and so forth. So here, they're trying to answer the question: How can I make something move without touching it? And um, learning about electrical um, forces and um, trying to design an experiment, experiment to answer um, how that may work. How is that even possible? So, um, just two examples of the kind of work that we're seeing now with students. Uh, and then more broadly, the outcomes that we really obviously want to emphasize in any um, learning of science and engineering here in Shoba, regardless of the resource. Um, but we're really appreciative that this resource so substantially supports this. Um, is that we want students to deeply learn science. We don't want them to just memorize facts. They don't need that anymore. We have lots of other ways to do that. So we want them to deeply understand what they're doing. We want them to retain big ideas beyond um, their academic day and, and, and life. Um, and we want them to be able to use this to make decisions in their world outside of school as well. Um, we always want our students to be able to build um, resilience in solving problems. A lot of these problems don't have a clear path forward. The kids have to grapple with it. I was in a second grade class where kid, kids had to really work through a problem and the pride on their faces in the end was um, like palpable. They were just so proud that they overcame this issue and, and did it together. So. Um, we know that students make decisions about their interest in science and math very early in elementary school, some of the research shows. And so we really want to make sure that kids are just, in general, having a positive experience with science that they don't rule it out. So at least they maintain their interest, even if it just helps them succeed academically, whatever that leads them to. Um, our, our goal is to make sure that they, we can support them to at least stay in the game so that they can make decisions when actually they're ready to make those decisions. Um, and then, as I mentioned already, uh, we definitely want to emphasize the outcomes of those lifelong skills, collaboration, communication, the social, pro social side, and obviously the literacy skills that are critical to their academic success and their life success as well. So we're really excited that we've had a resource that can support us in these areas and that's cohesive in that support, um, and we appreciate that. Any more questions, Kat? I have a, maybe three. <laughs> <laughs> Any more? Um, so how many years have you, this, has this been implemented? So we tried it last year mm -hmm. and um, then uh, purchased it only for teaching physical science last year, purchased the subscription and the consumables, and mm -hmm. this year was the first full year of, of implementation. So <coughs> kit, kit K, 8, and the expectation is that science teachers primarily, well, at the elementary level, they're generalists, but the middle school that this is integrated into the science curriculum? Yes, and at, at the middle school we um, purchased the subscription, but not they, it comes with consumable kits. We didn't purchase those because they're using this as a collect as part of a collection of resources. Yes. They're identifying, okay, I don't have something that really supports this area that I want to work on and this is kind of a go-to they can um, they can pull and so they've been um, over the year collecting together the the main go-to tasks from this. But no matter what middle school you're in, oh, students awesome. are going to have a STEM scopes experience. And frankly, we've worked over the last three years to um, have students have a um, universal science experience. The units that they are using are mm -hmm. the same across mm -hmm. the district. And well, the skills part are of the resources. The them. skills are important and transferable. Absolutely. So mm -hmm. it's just starting, and in a few years now, you're going to have all these kids moving up to the high school with mm -hmm. this approach mm -hmm. to learning science and engineering. So what? how will it be articulated mm -hmm. from eighth to ninth grade and beyond? So the, um, <coughs> I think the, the good thing about having standards, I guess, is that um, K to 12, we've really had right. to do work to adjust to that. The work that the science teachers have started doing is um, more adjusting their big lab experiences to um, kind of work along these same lines where they're um, unstructuring them, I guess I'll call it, mm -hmm. um, in order to um, ensure that students aren't just following a procedure that's presented to them and not really sure why. Um, and so I've actually participated in conversations with the in work with the bio teachers where they were working to kind of at all three levels in different ways um, unstructure that. And we have a new physics course that they've kind of built along that same idea. Um, Mike Tollison, who's part of that. 
um, building of that course was on our science and engineering committee where we did a lot of work digesting these practices and he's very invested in um, putting that in place at the high school as well. Super. So no, that's a great discussion. program. It's a, a great approach and to see it move up K-12. Absolutely. I wish this existed for up, 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 up. Does anybody have a good life together? Um, thanks for presenting, Martina. Um, <clears throat> I'm wondering if um, the initiative of STEM scopes was something that was put forth by um, teachers to address a need or some kind of efficiency, or whether it was put forth by administration in order to stay current with updated science, technology, and engineering standards, or like what what need did it did it fill? Great. So. Um we, uh, when the standards, the updated standards were released a few years ago, we formed a uh, science and engineering committee to kind of figure out what did we need to do to address it. And um, a number of elementary teachers were on that committee, I think it was like five or six. And through the process of that committee, we identified that we really did need a foundational resource, particularly at the elementary school. Um, if we did a survey across the, well, we did a survey across the district and um, even though we had pacing guides in place, people, people were in very different places with science. We didn't really have a lot of resources at the elementary school in particular. So in that way, that started our um, path toward STEM scopes. We um, looked around for resources that could help us both address the new standards, and we were very critical of resources. We threw out a lot because it didn't um, address the standards and meet our own vision for, for science. Um, and then a teacher group the committee and then I um, uh, took on volunteers or I um, asked for volunteers from um, even beyond that actually tried out the resource last year and, and was very instrumental in um, wanting to, to move it forward. So did this coincide with, with a, like a curriculum review? Yes, and then, mm -hmm. so yeah, it was part of a bigger body of work to it's, just adjust our curriculum. So every few years there's a curriculum review will this yeah. constantly be revisited as the standards yeah. get updated? Yeah, absolutely. About five years, yeah. But uh, we've designed it to meet whatever the need is, so it's not always five years. Yeah. Elise, did you have a question? Domestic. No, I just, I mean, I really appreciate you coming in and sharing this stuff because it's, I mean, it's really great, and the program sounds really great. And I've noticed a big difference in my own two kids this year in the way that they're starting to talk about science. So it's really cool to hear about it, you know, because I'm like, wow, you guys are really like using a lot of scientific language. Um, so thank you. And uh, also, just unrelatedly, that's my daughter's guitar, and I. Oh, I, 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 saw, I, saw, I, saw, I didn't know what it meant. I was like, but I was like, she knows something. About I know that guitar. guitar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. I had to help cut that hole out. It's very hard work. <laughs> well, so then you know, if, if you do read the how-to book, sometimes yes. you're like, my mom would be in a rubber band. <laughs> um, so I'm here, like, cut her finger off so trying to do it. <laughs> For the benefit of science. All the science. Thank you. <laughs> and Lynn, you had a question? Yeah, I was just wondering about the um, subscription and consumables. Is this something that we're committed to for a period of time, or, or are we just incorporating it? It becomes part of the curriculum, or are we forever going to be buying integration and curriculum and content? So in order to access the resource itself, we do have, as the world is kind of going to ongoing subscriptions, so we definitely have that. I do think that over time, we'll learn <coughs> more about what consumables we use and what we don't. And even this year in replenishing, I, I ordered off of Amazon um, instead of purchasing it. So I think that what we see as far as um, consumable costs will decrease, but the subscription, unless we moved away from it, would it? You're always going to have to have You that. have to, and that's the world The world is going that way. So this is subscription instead of books? It's right. subscription instead of books. And we're working on a correlation of books versus subscription and costs we talked about? Yeah, yes. we will absolutely, as we look at what we are purchasing, particularly for next year's, you know, my next year's budget. But I think what you're asking is a discussion that we said we would have after the budget right. cycle, right. and that was yeah. something that we really brought up. Yeah, we Okay, good. Thank you for coming out tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for your work on the grant. Much wow. appreciated with that. I'm that was that came through. Me too. I'm super work. excited. Thank you. <laughs> Okay. So our next agenda is the Neshoba Regional High School, well there's three, robotics competition travel approval request, a baseball competition travel approval request, and a cultural breeze trip approval request, and Principal Di Domenico is 
coming to share some information. We Poor guy, you've got a lot. I'll <laughs> put that light back on now, too, no. if you don't mind. Thank you. Thanks, Liz. A lot of travel. A lot of travel. A lot of travel. <laughs> so, you want to start? You want to, how do you want to handle this? Well, you've got a lot of materials in front of you. I don't, I don't, all I can say is I know each of these trips is a worthwhile trip. Um, well, I think maybe what we might want to do is just talk about the, um, the, the two, dare I say domestic, the, uh, and then we can talk mm -hmm. about Greece after. Um, so if we can talk about the um, baseball and, and the robotics, if we can check that out first. And I, I want to speak to this a little bit too, sure. if you don't mind, um, Crystal Domenico. And, and you can certainly fill in the blank. So the, the baseball <coughs> one is an interesting one because that, that's, uh, that's by invitation only. And our team was invited, and so this group is going heading down to Hyannis. It's, it, it, it's something that happens every single year, or even every other year. They happen to get the invitation this year, so that's why they're going down. Um, the robotics teams, uh, they they have generally two. They go down to New Jersey, and then they'll have one in Maine um, in about two months' time. Mm -hmm. um, we're very comfortable. I know that uh, uh, Assistant Superintendent McGuire has worked closely with everybody on these to make sure that everything is in place and ready to go. But I want to highlight one piece, and Lynn, you kind of alluded to this last time, and I'm going to bring this up right now, um, is the travel and how our kids are traveling, uh, particularly with these two. And I, I spoke earlier with uh, Chairman Ramosco on this as well. It's one of those situations um, when we talk about peeling back the layers of the onion, uh, you know, when, when new administration comes in, and just the fact that we're bringing these all forward to the school committee has shone different lights in areas we otherwise would not have seen, quite frankly, because for the most part, and it's no fault of anyone's, it's just that a lot of these trips have been under the radar, and it, I, I think I had said earlier to, to somewhere, perhaps even at this table, it wasn't until I started seeing uh, tweets going out of me, what do you mean our kids are there? I didn't know what's happening. And you start calling back and say, wait a minute, you know, we've, we've lost a process here. So also part of the process is that we didn't realize is that there's also a protocol that was attached to this. And in that protocol, it talks about the fact that um, automobiles are not, private automobiles are something that are not encouraged. In fact, it's discouraged. And um, to be honest with you, in, I, I was saying to Chairman Ramosco tonight, since I'm the principal, I remember it was discouraged, that you should always think, I was taught, always think yellow. We don't always think yellow anymore, because now we think about coach buses, but the whole notion that you didn't think about parent traveling or student traveling, you know, driving the car with other students in it, or parents driving, whether, and that's not saying that they're poor drivers, but there's a litigious component to this that's attached to it for school sanctioned trips. So these are coming before you tonight, um, but I will tell you that we've already had discussion. Um, I've had extensive, relatively extensive discussion with both Tanya Rich and Al Cordiani about this. Everything's in place for them, but we're not comfortable with the travel as it's outlined. But we've got that in motion. And what we're hoping that you will do tonight is approve both of these trips, knowing that we're, we are not going to be allowing the carpooling, for example, that is outlined in the robotics trip. Uh, we are looking at buses. We've been doing some good work on that uh, in, in the last little bit. In all fairness to these teachers, this is the first time this is coming their way. And so we have this little transition time period that we're trying to work through this. Um, so I and. I don't feel uncomfortable with it. I feel very good because it's getting to us to a, a very good place in terms of structure. I think for um, the baseball team, this gets back to um, it, it's a smaller, well, it's a, a small enough group of students, and it's close enough that we can take our sped vehicles, for example, um, the vans that we've got. Um, I've already spoken with our lawyer, who said yes, that's how that team should be traveling. Um, Al Fordiani going to New Jersey and Maine, not comfortable at all with those vans going because I'm not comfortable with this, the status of those vans right now to be traveling out of state, quite frankly. Um, so for those, again, I've had lots of discussion with Principal T. Domenico as well on this. So for 
those trips we're probably going to be looking at uh, a different uh, a different type of transportation, primarily bus. So that's where we see these two trips going from now. But I just want to shine a light for a minute and let let you know that we have not been not only were we not following policy, nor were, were we following protocol, and we have to make that change. The teachers were outstanding to deal with when I talked to them on this. So all the credit to them and to Principal Duke Domenico as we make this shift. So that, everything else is fine. We're comfortable with everything else. Thanks for doing that. Really, really appreciate that. Um, Lynn, <coughs> so when you bring the buses down the Hyannis, are the parents going to allow the buses or is it just the teams and the buses and the parents will drive themselves back and forth? The parents can certainly drive separately if they, if they choose to go down. And one of the problems, an issue that comes up with that particular trip mm -hmm. is the parents have always gone down with them and they've done different things at night activities and again I'm not wanting to change everything um, right now but for the sake of getting those students from here to there and back and and I think even things like suppers the meals and things like that if it's school sanctioned they should be in our school sanctioned vehicles whatever that looks like but this is, this is a cultural shift, I want to point yeah. that out. Go ahead. Um, first of all, I want to say that for many years, the, the, the robotics team um, at the high school um, under Al Fortiani has been exceptional. exceptional. We had robotics before anybody even knew what robotics. robotics. Um, and, and that being said, I guess that I'm concerned about this, uh, the application I think it was either October or November when we raised the issue about the, the German field trip and some things were put in place. We said we needed at least two weeks. We have a policy about fingerprinting. And so we have this before us now. The planned departure date is uh, a week from Friday and the fingerprinting is in process. And you know, we 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 kicked, um, we and, and for the for the German trip, we came in and had a special meeting. Once all the T's were crossed and I's were dotted to enable that to go forward, I guess I'm surprised that it is the end of February, and we have another situation where it's it's last minute and it's incomplete. I agree completely about the buses. Um, but this is um, more under folks' control, and I don't know when, the, if this was invitation, if, if they qualified for it, when they knew they were going I'll start to go. To, I'll start sure. to speak to you. You know what I'm getting at. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely do. So a couple, a couple of sure. things. Um, first of all, I think that one of the things that, and, and I've had this conversation with a number of staff, I think one of the things is that we're going to need to go back and revisit that policy, because the 90 days isn't, it, it, it doesn't really work. I think we said two weeks. Yeah. Well, it uh, uh, could be, but I think that uh, is a policy not 90 days? The policy uh, 90 days. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I, we've, we've got an issue there. So we've been, uh, so we, we need to streamline that and clean that up because the truth is we, we don't always know. Like, I mean, the, like the baseball team is a perfect example where you get it and it's like two weeks later or three weeks later, like you don't know about the invitation until you get it and then you have this short tie. And so it is problematic, I'm just gonna say just logistically, to make sure that we get it to a school committee meeting, and then if there's a problem with anything, and then to try to get it to that side. It's problematic, I mean, it just it is simply- But even in ones where it's like, okay, we've got three weeks and we could go, we could still get these documents emailed out to the school committee, and have everybody field their questions through Alita, mm -hmm. and That's then, I mean, yeah. we, we could handle this. So to Kathy's point, nobody wants the robotics team to miss anything, but I think the bigger, I mean, yes, there's the, we've got one week, and okay, that's kind of not enough time, but more the is the fingerprinting, yeah. so. And we were aware of that. And that's policy, so what are we gonna do if they're not done? Well, if they're not fingerprinted, they can't, these people can't go. I mean, it's it's pretty it's pretty stri simple, straightforward, and I believe that the principal did Minico, as I also had that conversation with uh, Mr. Fortiano. Yes. Elise. <coughs> How long is the process taking <coughs> for people getting fingerprinted? Is it like a week, 10 days? Is it? I don't know that I have that answer. answer. It's, it's much shorter than it used to be. It used to be quite a lengthy thing, but they're coming back now in, uh, within a week for the most part. You know, every time I'll get, there'll be a straggler that will take a little bit longer. 
I, so, so are we, are we expecting these? We're expecting the day, day or two. Or? Yeah, we're expecting yeah. all of these to be in place, <clears throat> quite frankly. But, but to the, I, I want to go back to Chairman Lamas's point because your point is well taken, and unfortunately, that's where we're the position we're finding ourselves in, saying to people, if this isn't done, it can't happen. So, it, it, but we're also not wanting to shut things down. Right. However. But this is difficult it's because it's such a, 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 a sea change for, for our folks and for the culture. And again, it's back to the high school again. Here's one more thing where they say, oh my goodness, more rules? Well, kind of, <laughs> you no, know, so. But when we talked about this back in October, November, yeah, for, for, for the poor German there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, Unfortunately, we know. I mean, every we, we talked about the ones that we know. Like we know the deck is going to go to Boston. We are it's going to have them, and, and those are set well in advance. Yeah, they knew this robotics thing was happening well in advance. So they're going to go to this one. They're going to go to another one. I mean, those should already be in process because they they know you know. And if they don't make them, then then they don't go. But and you know you're preaching to the choir on this. Uh, okay. Right. So no, no, I don't believe you talked about no, that. I, no, no, I totally But I agree. think it's well, I, totally I think it's agree. well said, and I think it's valid, and yeah. so people need to know, non-negotiable, two weeks, everything done, or forget it, because we're responsible if something happens to these kids, not the teachers, us. But we do understand about when you know, sports go and it's short notice, we get that, yeah. you know, for, but this one, they knew they were going to go. Uh, to be honest with you, in all fairness, I don't know about the New Jersey. The main one, yes, I don't know about the New Jersey. I don't know whether you know, but... Um, There's a signature date of January 20th, though. Oh, oh you're right. I see that. So why did we just get this? All right, whatever. I don't want to belabor it. Your points well taken. You know, I mean, that that's crazy. You just got to tell your folks. Well, the issue is the fingerprints are... No. So okay. where, where yes. do we stand? Like, it, well, it, this is what I was right. going to say. The outstanding mm -hmm. issues seem to be the fingerprinting is not done. <coughs> we don't have that the results and transportation. Mm -hmm. So either one of those is a deal breaker, I would imagine. The well, the transportation will be done. Yeah, the transportation will be done. Then it's Brooke's going to take care of it. Yeah. So you just have to, in our, if we're going to approve this or someone's going to make a motion, students will be transported in district, I already wrote it, okay. <laughs> sanctioned vehicles. What's that going to do the cost? It's not going to affect the cost. For the, uh, we, we can't We're going to end up it through yeah. the budget. We would <coughs> and the fingerprinting is non-negotiable. The fingerprinting has to be done or they can't go. So then, uh, yeah. So then you've only got one teacher going with 20 students, in worst case scenario. But there's nothing we can solve for that. We can't have one with 20 kids yeah. we, for overnight. No, so that, that's yeah. where, if, if we're, we find ourselves in that position, and I don't think we will, um, but given the dates that uh, that they're on a weekend, I don't I don't foresee a problem with a staff member saying, "Hey, I'll step up. I'll, I can go on that trip and uh, and satisfy the, the ratio requirement." But we have to approve it today. We don't have another mm -hmm. meeting um, unless we want to do what we did for the German trip. What? We no, came in, no, we, we met, and we said, "Oh no, we don't want to get into the same situation." No, I'm not going to, I think that was a massive inconvenience and I don't want to do it again. So I think you work it into the motion that it's contingent on the number of people. I don't care who the names are, you don't care who the names are. No, but we right? have a policy that says that chaperones have to be fingerprinted. Right, right. And, and I, and I, but I agree. Fun. I think that if that's written into the motion, then that's what's going to happen. That's, that's what will happen. Got it? Make sense? It it does. And how it is principal going to report back to us and say, or Bridge to Brooke, who will report to us and say, this is what we have? You know, um, if we approve it, we're responsible for it. If folks, if it doesn't pan out, then and we approve it. I've, I've certainly been going back and forth with uh, both uh, Todd and Brooke on this, and we'll continue to do so because. That's a question that, that lingers in our mind as well, and I've been given every assurance that it's being taken care of and that it's just a matter of time to get those things getting in, but I, I, I hear you, Kathy, when you say I think that we it's all a, do. an issue. I, yeah. So what's the, so let's get this wrapped up so we can move on, but to Kathy's point, what's the contingency plan? How many chaperones need to be on this trip? 
Well, with uh, 20 students, you have a, uh, you have a uh, uh, 10 to 1 ratio. So, uh, you know, Mr. Fortiani being one, he's well over and above uh, you know, the ratio right now. But uh, we'd make sure we satisfy at the bare minimum that, that requirement, the 10 to 1. So you would you would have at a minimum two yeah. chaperones to at a minimum, but to meet the <coughs> requirement. Most of these parents okay. are all involved. I mean, these parents are actively involved the, okay. in robotics. Okay. So, but yeah, but so that's not. So we're we're talking about the the nits and nats here in order to get this motion on the floor mm -hmm. and get it moved. What is it like? Well, if these parents are actively involved, I mean, this isn't the only um, robotics competition they've gone away for, right? Absolutely. So yep. why weren't they fingerprinted a while ago? We do, we, I'm just, it's a different issue, but just oh yeah. It's part of the, the broader issue. Gotcha. Though, so. so does this whole form have to be redone again when they finally find it, when we get to the right people that are going so it's accurate? We, we always do something people. right before. Yeah, if, if, oh. they're, if they're different people, we certainly we would, always uh, know. would make that correction. Okay. Okay, so. Assuming, oh boy, here, this is crazy. Assuming that that a minimum of two chaperones who are quarried and fingerprinted are clear. <coughs> Assuming that students will be transported in a district sanctioned vehicle. Are you guys good with? No, I'm, let me, Steve, hold on. Just go with this for a minute. Let's. Go with it. Are you okay with the trip, the overnight trip, from March eighth and returning on the tenth? If all the, if everything was satisfied, all our, our requirements were satisfied. Yes. Okay. It's a good trip. So, good does anybody else have a concern about the trip itself? No. Okay. So then, I think what we need is someone. This is going to be so convoluted, Alita, work with me. <laughs> Unless somebody wants to step up, I'll give it a shot. Um, to mm, move to accept the March 8th, returning March 10th, robotics competition in Mount Olive, New Jersey, for 20 students and a minimum of two quarried and fingerprinted chaperones for the students to be transported in a district sanctioned vehicle and stay at the residence in on the Con on Continental Drive in Mount Olive, New Jersey. How do you define As a district? Can somebody move the motion? Vehicle. So moved. Thank you. Somebody second it. Sorry, I got second it. Oh, wait, Thank I you. Think of myself, kind of. <laughs> no, but I appreciate the input. Now, what? How do we define a district sanctioned vehicle? It's a district sanctioned vehicle. So it's on Brook. If, if if Brook, Steve, are we going to boil the ocean here? Is it a P, is it POV or what are we talking about here? Is it a private vehicle? No, no. that's the point. We can't. That's have what private. I can't that's, see. That's okay, what it can't so be. okay. It has. It, it needs to be like a a, a bus or. Um, a, a vehicle from a, a district vehicle. That's really at the end what it boils down to. No private vehicles. No private vehicles. All right. Move the question. Already did. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Thank you. All those in favor? Oh my God! We did it! It's unanimous. All right. You got one down. So we have to do the and baseball one. one. The baseball I, one. I have a question though. When when did we talk about? Is that going to come up later? These activities with the um, these parents that are actively involved in the uh, like robotics. What are you looking for? I'm just wondering because they, this isn't the first competition that they've gone to. That they've gone to a better location. Do you remember a few meetings ago when, like, as, to use your term, that poor German teacher came yeah. forward? And do you remember that? And yeah. it was like, oh, they have to be fingerprinted. Right. Well, that was just determined a couple of months ago. Yeah. So I think what's happening now is... You're going and back and taking a look, right? Well, no, <laughs> it's going to be required. Cleaning, yeah, and cleaning things up. But we're tight, We're just really tightening up. So it's already it's supposed to be in place. <coughs> does that fall under a policy? Part of it is policy and part of it is protocol. 
So okay. it's even if it's not policy, it's an extra measure of safety, and I think it's important, and I think everyone here thinks it's important. No, I'm just so we're moving on. I'm just wondering if you have to do that in policy. No, you don't. Your policy's fine right now. Okay. Okay, let's talk about the next one. That's the one to Hyannis. Baseball. That's for the varsity great. baseball team. Mm -hmm. 24 students. One, two, three. Oh my gosh, they're all corded and fingerprinted. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We're, we're doing better, honestly. Well, no, I'm not being. I'm not degrees. I'm not being critical. It's just there's so many. There's so many things that I mean. It's hard for people. It's it's hard for our staff too. And thank you for getting this one to us with more than a week's notice. So, given that, does anybody have any concerns or questions about this particular trip? This is another one where we have to ensure that it's. District sanctioned transportation. That's right. No, we everything are all else, is, everything yeah. else is fine. Okay, so then I need someone to move. I'm not going to do this. I move that we approve the baseball trip, baseball team's trip to the Hyannis. As amended. Okay, so let me help with that. As 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 amended to include a school sanctioned vehicle for all transportation. Take on March 29th, returning on the well, 30th, first. March 29th, You kind of got to do the whole thing, don't you? <laughs> All right. Uh, and that the there will be three chaperones who are recorded and fingerprinted. That way everybody feels comfortable. That's it. Are we good? I'll say. Thank you. And who moved it? Steve did. You seconded it. Any questions? All those in favor? Thank you. It's unanimous. Next one. No. Grease. <coughs> Come on up and join us. This is Jackie Carter. She's a great teacher. Do not mess around with her. <laughs> I mean, today, tonight's already blown, yeah. right? So what the heck? It's, it's all good. It's all for good stuff. So do you want to give us just a bit of water? Sure. Water so, Thanks. Um, so a grease trip was planned about a year and a half ago, actually. Um, just takes that long for a trip this size to kind of get off the ground and decisions to be made. But it's through EF Tours, which has um, been in business since 1965. And, uh, they are world class um, at what they do. And so there's 45 um, travelers, there's five chaperones um, with a dedicated tour guide throughout 24-7 uh, mm. from uh, EF. Uh, so there's six that will be with us, all uh, teachers, all Corey, all fingerprinted, and all background checked. Yeah. Uh, true, yeah, they add that extra layer. Um, I included the itinerary, so it's nine days. Uh, we are bused to the airport. Uh, we have a stopover in Frankfurt. We go to Greece. Uh, we're going to a number of different uh, cities and a few stops <coughs> in some different islands. Uh, Athens, um, I've built in some little additional things like stopping at an olive farm. Um, we have a cooking class uh, that will be done as a cultural trip. And <coughs> uh, we go to islands like Mykonos and uh, Rhodes and Santorini. Uh, and the trip actually uh, was designed through students. Students came to me and um, knew I had led tours for a number of years. And a, a lot of the seniors that are graduating this year I've had since freshman year, and I'm their class advisor. So they said, we want to go to Greece, we want to go to Greece for two years, they've been asking. So we put this together, and uh, we're leaving, we're supposed to leave April 12th, Friday, we don't miss any school, and we come back on Easter Sunday. Thank you. Okay. Any questions? <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, yeah, I, I, I have a question, I'm Corey. <laughs> Why are all the chaperones <laughs> teachers? Well, um, the, and not me. And not you. <laughs> yes. Um, well, it, that could change in the future if you'd like to come. It to sure could. Would love to include a school committee member or a superintendent like or, or a member of the community. A member of the community. Who yes. was a they're, former school committee member? Absolutely. They're they're fantastic <laughs> trips. They're the best thing that I've done. Um, it's life changing for the kids. It's life changing. It's been life changing for me to travel with them, <coughs> to watch them grow. It's um, probably the best experience in the world. Yeah. 
So about 45 students are going. Uh, you might have mentioned it. How, what was the criteria to select the Anybody students? Anybody could come? Anybody? Anyone. Yep, so it was a- Nine to 12. Uh-huh. Yep, so it was an announcement made. Um, this, uh, you know, before you could make just an announcement. If anyone's interested in receiving <coughs> information about a Greece cultural tour, uh, leave your uh, email address in the front office. So it was just a list put up. And so then um, anyone who did inquire, uh, we sent out information. It was a process, you know, and only a certain, one bus. I didn't want two buses, so mm -hmm. I had to draw it off. Draw a line at some point once it got filled. And they're leaving later on Friday the 12th? We so are after school. Okay. So if there are no other questions, I'm going to have Kathy. Okay. Um, I move to approve the Neshoba Regional High School Cultural Free Field Trip request on um, April 12th, uh, 2019, to April 21st, 2019, to Greece and the Greek Islands. For, it says 50 students and five chaperones. Do you have 45? Uh, no, sorry, it's, it's 45. 45 sorry, students 45 and, five. and five chaperones, yes. as detailed in the approval request form. Students will be transported in district sanctioned vehicles, and, and that's it. Second. Thank you. Any questions? I said a comment. Sorry, Lily. Just I wanted to point out that when you work with a company like EF Tours, like this, like Jackie has, like I have in the past, they obviously take on so much of the safety and the liability that exists. And what you didn't mention is there is also somebody in Greece from EF who is on the ground should there be an issue, yeah. etc. Yeah. They're very, very good at doing that. So when you go through it, just the juxtaposing going with a company like this, um, they take care of a lot right. of that for you. We actually also build in. Um, an extra, it's an extra fee that they know they get. It's a travel protection. So if anything were to happen, uh, they would fly their family there. They would fly them home at no one's expense. It's, so it's a really good thing to have. Okay, okay great. Thank you. Thank you. All Thank those you, in favor? Oh. It's unanimous. Oh, sorry. Oh. <laughs> oh my God. Oh, it's all good. It's all good. Okay, let's go on. Oh, good. The E rate update. Let's move this along, people. So I have an E-rate update for you. First, I'd like to um, explain to you a little bit for those people that don't know what E-rate is. It's um, a federal program. It's uh, called the Universal Service Schools and Libraries Program. And it um, reimburses districts, libraries, up to 90% on their telecommunications and internet access. Um, it's the percentage base is on free and reduced populations. And they offer two categories for reimbursement. Category one is for connections, which are um, internet and fiber between our buildings. And we get a 50% reimbursement on that expenditure. Category two is, a net, is for network equipment. And it's part of a five-year program um, fiscal year 20 is the last year of that program. Um, and the network equipment uh, is the network switches and the wireless access points. Um, basi basically, um, I think it was 2016, they came up with a, a population um, for each school and uh, an enrollment for each school and they have an allowance of $150 per student in order for us to equip our schools with these wireless access and network switches. So um, fiscal year 20 would be the last year for this program. In fiscal year 20, built into our budget, we have expenditures that will bring us to 100% of our um, expenditures at the high school and over 50% for our other um, schools across the district. Um, one of the things that you have to do with um, this ERA program is you have to have the ability to pay for the program, for whatever it is you purchase in full, and then they reimburse you in the following year. So we're always one year behind on what we get for the expenditures in a given year. Um, and just so you know, it's not like one of these things, like if we had some money left at, say, center school, um, we can't buy um, equipment 
with that money that's allocated because all of the equipment has to be labeled that it's E-rate and, um, and, and as it's designated in the application process. Um, at, like I said, the, um, this <coughs> year 20 is the last year of the program, but at my recent NASBO meeting, they um, let us know that there are still some funds that people haven't asked for. There are a number of districts that haven't applied for these funds for whatever reason, so there's still money left in the pool. They're looking at a couple of different ways as, as to how they're going to disperse this. They may continue the same program and may be allocated to us or an, another kind of equipment or the same kind of equipment. But um, that's about where we stand right now with E-rate. We're in a pretty good place. <coughs> so if anybody has any questions, I try to answer them. <laughs> that was a good overview. Yeah. I don't know that we've ever gotten that <coughs> type of an overview comprehensive, so thank you. Appreciate that. It's good to have you here, Pat Maroney. Um, okay, we are now moving into old business, and um, two big chunky ones. The biggest chunky one is um, the FY20 budget. So. We've got three sub bullets under this agenda item, but that doesn't mean that we can't talk about other aspects of the budget, just so you all understand. Um, the reason we have these three sub bullets is because they were topics that we discussed at the last one and we knew we were going to come back to them. Okay, so the first one is full day kindergarten. So, level set, where are we with it? Um, I think where we are is that the school committee generally agrees that we want to adopt um, universal kindergarten, which means there will not be a cost for full day kindergarten for anyone in the district. We currently have full day kindergarten, but it comes with a cost, not a fully loaded cost recovery expense to families, but an expense nonetheless. If students or parents want their child to attend half-day kindergarten, they can do that at no fee, level set. So tonight what we need to talk about is if, the, if, we, if it is accurate that we all agree that we want to move forward um, with implementing universal free full day kindergarten, the question is when do we want to implement the program how do we garner the upfront cost for the first year, which is about $600,000? Um, and how long do we want that um, gathering up of those funds in order to be able to afford that one year that we don't get any reimbursement in um, to be? And I want to also just share one thing. I got a couple of questions over the past two weeks. There is, a, there is a misconception out there, and this is hard stuff, because there's a lot of information, right? And then people go and talk, and then they get it wrong, and it's all confusing. There is never going to be a time, or there is not a time now, where the state is going to pay for the full cost of full day kindergarten. It doesn't happen now. It's not going to happen next year. It's going to be interesting to see if it ever happens. There is still a cost borne by the district and likely the cost that we have now maybe a little bit will shift but it's dependent upon the number of kids that come into the district so there is no full cost recovery through the state for universal k right that's right okay i, I just think it's really important because i've even heard some of us kind of mixing up that metaphor so given all that craziness where do you guys want to be with us, funding this program, and when? Elise. So, I know it's the next piece on this little sub-bullet, but I would almost rather we made a decision about, even if, you know, I realize we can't control what happens next year and the year after and what other school committee members do in the future and other, you know, administrators. Um, because, I would be comfortable with two years, I'd be comfortable with three years, but I think getting back to what we've mentioned in our last meeting, or one of the meetings where we talked about this, 
Um, I also want to see us trying to be diligent about OPEP. And so if we say, no matter what, we're going to put in 50K a year, but then you know that means we end up being able to still do kindergarten in two years, then I'm happy. If we're saying 50K a year, but it means actually it's ended up taking us you know three years to get to that 600,000, that's less awesome, but it's still we're making the commitment. But I don't want to make that commitment and say, pick an arbitrary number like two or three years without also having kind of talked about how much we're going to try to set aside for OPEP. Does that make sense? No, right. it makes yeah. sense. So I'm going to broaden what you said. I really appreciate that you said that because I think that, uh, but I'm going to broaden it. And I'll tell you why I appreciate it because I'm going to broaden it. It's, I don't even know that it's about OPEB. I think it's about where we are here and now for this year. We do have a commitment. We, we, we have a commitment that we have to fulfill for <coughs> retiree health. And we're paying as we go right now. And, and that's okay until you look at the curve of people that are retiring. So we are not 10 years, whatever, how many years, going to be able to afford retiree health care in a pay-as-you-go stance and not have to reduce existing programs and staffing because of the number of people that are retiring. That's just reality, right? Okay. But I want us to also think, and that's why I'm saying, so for this year, it's like, oh, you know, we found $300,000. Let's just plunk it into this program. I'm not there. I'm not saying we shouldn't use a chunk of it, but I want us all to also think that we did not make it into the state's program for the high school for this coming year. But we've already committed to refiling a statement of interest. We know that's a million to a million to, we don't know exactly for that feasibility study. The state said, we encourage you to do this again. There were other people in the queue from the previous year. No promises, but, and we all know that we have all committed to doing something with the high school. The communities want us to do something with the high school. So there's that expense. We have pulled $500,000 to fix problems at the high school up mm -hmm. out of the budget. We're going to be looking at um, borrowing instruments for that outside of the budget this year. So I get it. We want to do this. We want to do this universal K. We all want to do it. But I want us to think about the responsibilities on the plate. That, that's it. So to your point on OPEB, I would say if there's like, oh my gosh, I didn't realize that I had started this savings account a couple of years ago, and there's the 300,000 bucks. That's awesome news. Like, I, I mean, celebrate it. But what do we want to do with the money, to your point? And then you're going to get to, well, I want to do it in two years. I want to do it in three years. And I guess I'd like to hear what other people have to say, because I really appreciate what you just said. If I can just mention two, I think two, it does tie in. Uh, so I think it's okay to have the discussion broader right now because I think that it's all I think that's what we're doing. Yeah. So what do you other folks, everyone <coughs> needs to have an opinion at this table about every one of us. There is no way I'm letting you off the hook. Madam. So um, sort of along Elisa's line, um, I had thought about the OPEP money. And I know last year and this year, the original, you know, amount that we were going to put into OPEP was 50, and we added another 50. We said 100, right. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, let's face it. We owe 42 million. I mean, I don't, oh, 43, sorry. I don't know what the plan is for getting us to 43, but my thinking is, and, and, and maybe it's fiscally irresponsible, is that we've been chugging along, putting little pieces in, is it going to kill us to take that 50, put 50 in OPEB, and then take the other 50 instead of putting it in OPEB, put it in our full AK account for three years? That's $150,000 right there. We're talking about $300,000 that Brooke says she can scrape out of other revolving accounts. Well, I want to see where they're scraping from. I mean, 
Well, I you missed the meeting. Well, we I'm can't so, go back. Right, then I don't. Then no, I'm, no, no, no. Don't, don't give up that easy. No. But, <laughs> but no, no. But that's my thinking. If you're scraping, and when we say, if there are, I want to see where the money's coming from because what I worry about. Oh, hi, Pat. Let her know. Yeah. Yeah. What, what I worry about is, and this, this is not just this year, but, but every year is that, um, you know, we have this, an initial ask for the budget. And then it gets reduced and reduced and reduced and reduced. Now we're down to, I, I think, um, uh, to a good place. Um, and then we for lack of a better word, find money. I worry about what that does to our credibility uh, with the towns. I don't know. Um, I do know that the way that this needs to be framed is that this is a program. We just heard about the STEM scopes. That was program development to enhance a curriculum, to make it consistent with, you know, that old trope about 21st century learning. I mean, it's great stuff. Now, I don't hear that in how we brand full day K. I hear full day K, full time, half time, blah, blah, blah. I think to build support for it, understanding of it, it should be framed around what it means programmatically. What difference is this going to make for kids? We are, and we're not, and there's a difference between spending money, in my mind, and investing. <coughs> we are investing, we're looking for money to invest in our full day K program. And that's what we ought to be talking about. And then, you see what I'm saying? You so know what, I though, but I think, I, I get what you're saying, yeah. but I think, we're, I think we're like beyond that now. I, I mean, I, I, I think we're beyond that. Because beyond right what? now, the discussion is not, do we want to do it? It's, how are we going to do it? No, no, I get it. But it should be, that, that those two things should be married together. That this is a program. It's not just so, kids can go to kindergarten all day or full day. Why is it important? What is it going to do? But if we, gonna... if we go, uh, Kathy, I get it, and you made your point, and we can, yep, and, okay. and I think we're there. If we go back to the philosophical discussions, I think it's going to open up Pandora's box for things that you don't <laughs> intend, or that I don't think anybody wants to intend here. And, and I do think that that was one of the reasons why the principals came and spoke the way that they did. For this, because that's when we we're talking about the very thing that you were okay. talking about. Okay, but when the dust settles, and people who are not sitting at this table who are looking at how we spend our money, they're going to be talking about money. They're going to be talking about programming and the value of having full day K. That's my only point. I don't want to open this up again. I know philosophically most of us are there, um, but it's not what what sticks with folks, and, and, and my point is that it should. But and that's, then you're but that's your job, so when someone talks to you and they ask Nobody you about it, me. well then get your butt out in your community because that's what you should be no. sharing with people but I is the know reason why. Where the money's coming from and if are the towns concerned, uh, do the towns know that our goal is to build this program? That's your job. You go tell them. So where do you guys, what do you want to do, Elise, oh. I mean, Elaine? Sorry. Uh, so Again, it's was, the night. There was a question from last meeting that you said you need to check the auditor about those revolving funds. Mm -hmm. So and what we was did. the outcome of that? Yeah. Problem? So we're we we're, we're fine. We we have um, two hundred thousand dollars sitting in one account that we can draw down on, and we've also we asked the auditor where we could house that, what vehicle this could look like. We've cleaned up the K account in this last audit, uh, this last year or so, because it was in a deficit, because again, you run a deficit every year. So that's clean right now, so it's a, it's a good vehicle for us to use, to use a, a, for lack of a better term, as a, sa a savings account, where we could transfer money into that account, and it would sit there for the time, until whatever time period it is, like whether it's two years, three years, four years, five years, whatever time period. So we do have a vehicle in place now that we can do. We've got 200,000 that we can pull from one account and 100 that we can pull from the other, which is exactly what I was talking about last time. So for the 300, so, so they what, don't have to be. So they're not restricted accounts. Exactly. Right. So so that but leaves they could us. Be. But they don't. <laughs> I have to say that. The qu that's you can say what you want, but we had this conversation <clears throat> before. The question is, is it restricted? I asked it last week. Elaine has asked it again. The answer is no. Right. That. that. Right, and right. that's that's the response back. Okay. Which is why we can we feel that we can 
comfortable doing what we can do. I'll throw another monkey wrench in here. <laughs> what the hell is <laughs> <that> at this point? <laughs> Get that down, Rubenstein put in the monkey wrench. Um, the stipulation accounts that we set up last year, that we asked the stabilization? Last year. Oh, the stabilization, stabilization mm -hmm. accounts. The one for the field, which, uh, which Lynn was very concerned about. We have that field coming up for whatever, the rug. long before the carpet, long before the bonds are paid for. Okay. So we have that as an expense. When we were talking about health care last year, Chairman Ramosco brought up the golden uh, penalties that might occur. So I mean, we, we, we have a whole host of, do you remember that? Mm -hmm. We have a whole host of large expenses, plus the longer it takes us to deal with getting MSBA to approve something or whatever, we have, we're, we're, we're gonna be subject to more and more issues like the fuel tank the and tank. other things that happen at the high school. I think to take a whole chunk of that for 300,000 at this point in time is somewhat irresponsible and that I, I personally would be more comfortable with saying 100,000, 100,000. I know it stretches it out before we give free kindergarten, but I would be more comfortable with that rather than stripping us down to the bare minimum of what we may have in some sort of reserve, per se. How do you feel about that? Well, my concern is that if we, the longer we stretch it out, the more opportunities there are to raid that fund or to use it for something else. If it's about a matter of priorities for me. If we decide this is a priority, we're looking at funding a temporary gap, then let's get it done, let's get it over with, and then let's take that money that we were saving two, three years, whatever. And like, I liked Mike's idea from the last meeting, like, let's dedicate that to OPEB. I know we can't say what future committees would do, but like, let's get past Let's push past it and then use that money for something else. Well, what I, think, if, I guess my, that's my question. What is the other money that you're referencing that would? Well, if we save, if we if we use the three hundred thousand dollars, we're not talking about that. If we save a hundred thousand dollars this year, a hundred thousand dollars next year, a hundred thousand dollars in the third year in order to implement Six, the three full day kindergarten, yeah. then in our budget process, we've sort of been allocating hundred thousand dollars a year. Let's keep that hundred thousand dollar allocation, but let's switch it to something else. To, to open, for example. Yeah. yeah. Like that in our in our process, that money will already have been built in. I like that on its face, and I like that philosophically. And and I will just say it's you know the makeup of the committee is going to determine whether that happens or doesn't. Yeah. To your point, you made the yeah. point, um, but um, things get lost in translation things get dropped so I'm not sure that we can really make any commitments for future years and future committees and future budgets I mean we can say we you know the intention is to do this in three to four years I'm not comfortable with two you won't get my vote on that I'm sorry um, I, we have too many other important um, financial constraints and I think everybody knows that, the administration knows that, you guys know that, um, so I can absolutely get behind it, but I, I feel like, and anybody that has any questions about this, feel free to reach out to me. I have no problem sharing with you the realities of what we're staring at. Steve made the comment about some of that. Comfortably, we have 300,000 found dollars. I'd say you need to put at least a hundred thousand of that in OPEP in addition to what you already have there and then if you want to use the rest of it towards this allocation you know if you want to put a little bit towards the carpet because that I completely forgot about then then do it but go ahead I, I think one thing that's important to remember is that there are a lot of um, I, I don't want to say competing interests but there are that different members of the community, different members of the district have different priorities. So while a priority to implement full day K in a two to three year time frame is a priority for some, contributing to a liability the size of OPEB is a priority for others. 
And addressing some of these unexpected costs is also a priority, and working towards the SOI and being able to fund that appropriately is also a priority. So I'm, I, I'm, I typically take the middle road. So my middle road on this is take a little bit of it, put it towards um, our funding for full day K, but I would say I'm, I'm not comfortable with two years. Even three years, I really think it's, it's a four or, or a five year process. And I know that some people want to push that in, but I think that that would be disregarding some of the other completely legitimate concerns that other members of the district have and where our money goes. I and mean, we're already in a really tight spot this year with our budget, and we've got other things to, we've got other, we've got other considerations, um, and I think that that's something that we need to keep in mind. Yeah, please. So, and I just want to say too, keep in mind that my job, my role here was to break forward, uh, you know, a, a, a blueprint. That I'm not offended at all with whatever route it is that you decide to take at the end of the day. So I want to be really clear on that. Um, and and I agree with a lot of what Steve said as well. And and that that don't think because we have to come up with the money for for whatever it is. We've got I'll, I'll always got to figure that out. So I think your points are really all of your points are very very well made. So I'm not I'm not wed. That that's the presentation, but I'm not wed to that. If you come back, I res I'm so respectful of every one of you. I will respect whatever de that decision is. I'm very comfortable with whatever decision you come forward with. But my one thing, and, and, and I, I guess what I don't want to see, is I don't want a repeat of what happened previous to my time. And so I want to make sure that if you say three or four years or five years, that is that's it. on you. That that is. That's going to be on you, well, then that and that's you. not going to happen. And I'll tell you <laughs> why. Because the last time what happened was not the school committee. No, I understand. It was the superintendent sending a letter to the community saying, "Guess what you're getting," right. which is why you said, "What the heck? My kid is nine, and we still don't have it." Yeah. So, so the chat. But what we're doing here. I absolutely here, understand that. Right. <laughs> so let's make sure that you know that whatever we decide. You own, not us. I'm not, and, and that wasn't meant to be negative. No, all. no, I, I don't I, think I'm that sorry. it was, but I'm <laughs> saying, no, 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 we'll make our decision and then yeah. you okay. carry it through. That's right, yeah. that, that's, totally that's right. Of what we said. Yeah. So I'm just, I just want to, I guess the only reason for bringing that up is because I feel that there needs to be comfort for those young parents that are coming through, that whatever the decision is, they know that they, right. they can take that to the bank, that's all. That was my whole right. at that point. Can right. I ask one right. more question? The last time we were talking about this, which was six years ago, did it ever get this far? Did the discussions get this far? No. So we're on a different track then. No, no, that's why I said, I mean, no, Lynn and I vote, were the only ones that were here. The vote came up, and we said no, and he sent letters to all the parents saying yes. And we found out about it because parents called us up. I don't remember that. I, oh, I, yeah, we said no. I, I remember hearing about it from the community. Yeah. Oh, guess what we're doing? I was like, really? We are. We, we, That's how it came it. up. But, but, but this. No. The, what's happening now, and that's why the superintendent going and doing this intense investigation, talking to all these different districts. I mean, you couldn't have done a better job. Thank you. And uh, honest to God, us, like yeah. that was why we kept pushing back because we didn't have the information. It was kind of like cherry picking it. Now it's all there, and I get everybody wants it, but it's like, how can we do it? It was never we'd never want to do it. It was always, how can we do it? Now we know how we can do it, and the path forward is, what's, what's, the, t what's the time frame, and what's the commitment financially? And you're the only one that hasn't said what you want to do. Well, well, and I said no, but no. That's uh, okay. What the, the problem I'm having is we are committing the community to a fee. Whether Desi continues to provide a portion of it, we're still increasing the budget by X. Okay. You know, and it's going to increase the budget, which we'll have no control over. And we still have, like we said, we still have the high school coming up, feasibility study, we still have the run. We still haven't paid for the 2000 capital expense for the high school. Um, we're still paying that off. I mean, there's a there's a commitment of money coming up through us, and by putting in the K, it is a commitment that we can't take away. It's there. So that, that part is absolutely true, but, yeah. but just keep in mind that 
that you're already paying, and I think that that's the discussion you and I had earlier today too, you're already paying for that cake anyway. Like, you know, when, when I put those slides up, you're already paying a portion of it, <coughs> and what's offset, and, and you're paying for... But that Chapter 70 money is not guaranteed. Well, the Chapter 70 will always be... There'll always be Chapter 70 money, right? And it'll it will always, always be the kindergarten. They took it away from the state, why won't they take it away from that? I don't know, because, no, because what, what's going to happen is your K falls in, so you have true K to 12 now. So your Chapter 70 is based on K to 12, as opposed to right now, ours is 1 to 12 with a half day K. That's going to complicate things, but it's really <coughs> 1 to 12. So it, it, your Chapter 70 money just just changes to adopt in bringing that K. So uh, it, it's not going to increase it substantially. The, the problem is that first gap year. That's really the issue, to have the money when you're not getting any tuition money and you're not getting any um, you're still going to have an expense. You're still going to have the expense, expense no matter And it's going to be about what you're paying. What you're paying now. It's, it's, it's there's no major more. increase. Okay, and then as far as the 300000 goes, to use Neil's term, the optics are really bad. I want to, uh, so... That's what Kathy's saying. But I want to go back to that because, uh, to, to be honest with you, <clears throat> you asked us to come back and yeah. tell us how to find something, and we did. That's what we did. And we went back. <laughs> It, but it's great, but we're scrambling to get out another hundred thousand dollars, and there's three hundred thousand dollars sitting somewhere. Okay. It doesn't look good. But let me, can I just make a yeah. comment? That preschool revolving account that we were, were talking about, we changed the program dramatically this coming year. We did not know how our revenue was going to flow into that program. It could be that the money that's sitting in that revolving account could have been, used could have been most of it could have been used up if we didn't have enough students being tuitioned in. It's all dependent on a special ed population because the special ed population does not pay for, you know, it doesn't pay tuition. It's only the, um, what is it, the model the children. Model. The, regular, yeah, the, the that, role models. The role models that pay for it. So if that, Tuition was mm -hmm. low, or even if more had um, free and reduced applications, then we would have got even less. So it, I was, I've been watching that all year since September when we first started to get all the initial payments in. I, I've been watching it continually. I, I get monthly updates on every bit of revenue that's coming into that account. I'm comfortable that a program right now. <coughs> can sustain at least 200000 to be taken out of that towards this program. And that's why Brooke and I discussed that. And as, as far as, um, and the reason why there was even any money in, in that account is because um, the budget process in the past, prior to our forensic audit, um, we, they used the revenue that came into that account as a um, funding source for the budget. And no expenditures were ever placed against the revolving account. So, and, and there were two accounts that that was happening once. It was with in this extended day and preschool. So that money is still sitting there, and it's not a lot of money. And again, the same thing with the extended day program. We want to make sure that that's a standalone program. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm doing everything I can to treat it as if there, it's a standalone program for all the benefits, the cost of them being in our buildings till six o'clock at night. I, I try to make sure that everything is as I, you all requested. So moving that forward, I, I think that you really need to look at that money. It's not found money. It's just money that we needed to make sure we were stable with it before we decided to commit it to anything else. But I think what Lynn is saying, I'm going to put it in different words, because I okay. think what, it, it, you tell me if I'm wrong, but I think I can read you by now. I think the, the, I think the concern is, but if we're pressed to do this, why should we be pressed to do something else and find and challenge the budget to find even more in other ways? Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Do you understand what I'm trying to say? You the mean way, the regular appropriation? No, what I'm saying is don't think about these two accounts that you're, mm -hmm. but 
if the challenge was where, geez, could we find the money somewhere? And now all of a sudden you've been, I mean, and, and I know it sounds like much simpler than it really was, but you were able to find that money by kind of really clamping down or doing whatever. I think the concern is from folks in the community, then where else could you do that? Where else could you tighten the belt? Where else could you, and maybe you're gonna say, I'm giving you an out here, and it might be the real one and it may be made up, I don't know. Well, everything else was cleaned up except those two accounts, and now that we know where, where we stand, we can use that. I think that's pretty much exactly yeah, that's where, pretty we much, where we stand. Yeah, that is pretty because much. Because we've, we've run these programs now for the last year and we're comfortable and we're saying, yeah, we're, we're, feeling, <clears throat> we're feeling that they're stabilized right now. But I, but I think, you know, to Lynn's point, you you got to understand, like, if, if you're not sitting at this table, or even if you are, if you're not dabbling in the, in the budget and you're not managing the budget on a day-to-day -day basis, you're sitting out in the community and you're hearing about this, it's kind of like, what are you talking about, right? And, and people don't necessarily have a, an understanding of what the $300,000 means in the budget. What does that mean on the assessment? So I, I'm just reiterating what Liz is saying. I guess what we, we said, I, you know, I, I think now I'm really kind of saying, hmm, I guess we should not have done that. Like that I'm just saying that that's what it feels like. Well, if like. you didn't do that, no, and then we found out, I think no, that would I'm be worse. Saying, I'm just saying, I mean, it's, it's, it's the spirit of transparency. I thought that I thought that that's what you were looking for us to do. So that's what we did. Okay, we so you're misunderstanding. You're no, misunderstanding. I don't think so. I, I do, so. I do, I do, because I think what Lynn was saying, and you're, and you, you got to. You did good. I think what Lynn was saying was, if you can find it here, you know, the optics to the community are, well, where else can you find it? You're taking it as, I thought I did the right thing. Yes, you did, and we're saying, and where else can you find money? Yeah, but it sounds like the, the pre-K revolving account um, was specifically because of a change in programming, and so therefore it's not, not necessarily found money, it's a change in programming that costs less than was expected for the year. Now, in my opinion, that money came from early education. It should stay in early education to take it and say, well, we're going to use it for a different priority. I mean, it, this is a matter of priority. So let's ask this question. Keep, keep that thread. Was that program self-sustaining or was there money from the budget offsetting the cost of that program probably not okay so elaine so but that's important so let's continue your thread there's money that's sitting in that account well that was money that people put in and if parents put it in we should use it just for early end what we're getting at here is but that wasn't self-sustaining the budget was coming up underneath yeah. it, so what's left in there may have been tuition dollars, but what augmented the full cost of the program was money yeah. out of the budget. So that's a wash to me. I understand. I think it still comes back to priorities. We're saying that that, that may be school, your argument, and that's valid. Surf, all of these other things are just more important. I mean, I disagree with that, but that's what it sounds like we're saying. I don't think we can go around the table and say we all support universal kindergarten and then say but we'd like to do these 10 other things first. Well, I, I, well, we I don't think that's true. That. I think what we're, we need to get to right now is what do you want to allocate this year in the FY20 budget for free day K? Right, but the, the less we allocate, the less chance it actually happens because it takes longer to actually. Well, that, again, it kind of goes back to something you said at an earlier meeting, which was the state's gonna force us to do this. Well, we could think that, but I can tell you the state's going to force us to pay our retiree health. We already know that. This is not Those are on the books. This is not either or, though. We can do both. I mean, we put a hundred thousand dollar alloc both. allocation into OPEP already this year in the budget. We put so yeah, and as a percentage, I don't know. That's where my priority is. I understand it's low, but to, there are educational benefits to moving to K, and I'm not going to rehash that. But to know that we're just going to put money aside at what to me feels like the expense of investing in our students. There's a definitely a balance there, but this one to me feels like this to is the, to the to, you know, I'm gonna take issue with that and then we can close this out because I don't want to get frustrated any more than I already am. But that statement, that statement of um, investing in our students, I think is offensive to the whole committee 
because we have all, everything we do, everything these people dedicate their lives to, every program we have, every, the, um, the robotics, that carrying the English program from year over year over year with all the stuff that you've done, and mathematics, is all about investing in our students. So that's not fair. That's I'm, not fair. I wasn't trying to imply or state that at all. I was just saying. I but that's what you said. So it's okay. We get your point. Program. Your point is your priority is this. That's okay. But don't take it out on the rest of the programs. Steve. We have full day K now. The issue we're talking about is whether we are going to absorb the total cost of that or whether it is going to be a shared cost between the school committee or the school committee budget and the parents who are getting the advantage of the program. I think we, but I think we passed that, argument. right? But that's the basic argument we're having here. In reality, because we already do have all day K, we don't, it's, but it's not free all day K. Right. So don't, don't, don't tell me that we're missing out on educating the oh. younger kids because we're not offering it at all, but we are offering it. And we're offering it, but we're offering it where the cost of the program is shared between the school district and the parents who are get, having, having the advantage of the, of the program. Well, the model would change that. But that's, that's basic, the basic issue here. So at this point, somebody might as well just throw a motion out on the table. I was going to say, can I throw a number out? Go yeah. ahead. <laughs> Off the top of my head, 100000 for OPEB, 200000 for K. I would second that. But that's only for this year? Yeah, How many years motion. we've done No, you can't, right. we can't commit future committees. Because the 300000 is gone. Yeah, I know. And then, so, so now it comes out of the budget the, next year. Correct. The superintendent's original plan had an allocation for next year's budget, which is why we need to do this conversation. That's what now. that's what she's talking about. This for this for FY twenty, right? Yeah, but is it? Am I misremembering? No. I, I, what, so it kind of goes back really to what Kathy said originally was that the, in a perfect and again in a perfect world. I know that we're not in a perfect world, but. Three hundred thousand. What I what we were originally looking for is splitting that six hundred thousand down the middle, right? Three hundred thousand from from these other accounts, the the, uh, the two revolving accounts, and then the three hundred thousand would because it, it, you're still short three hundred thousand dollars to get to that full six hundred. So how do you find that? And and again, I'm not wed to anything, but I was saying. Is that something we put in the budget line? Like we don't have anything in the budget line right now at all. And so I was waiting for this discussion to finally wrap <coughs> up and decide: do we do anything for the budget this year or not? What what I'm hearing is no. But but then that leaves us. The longer we go for okay, then how are we going to come up with the other three hundred thousand? Because that's still the that's still an issue for us. We have the first three hundred thousand, but somehow. In all of this, we have to find out where the other three hundred thousand is coming. No, I mean, from. I would add another hundred thousand per year if I was going to map it out. I would prefer to see it in three years, but I don't think we can do it and still also set aside money for OPEP, honestly. But if, so I, I'll add that on. Sorry, the hundred thousand into the next budget. If we are using money that isn't in this budget, but that is in this revolve. We, these revolving accounts, <coughs> and what we have is approximately three hundred thousand dollars. Right, and we took, yeah. so it's not, it doesn't impact the budget numbers. It does not. And again, I mean, looking forward to next year, is there any reason why we wouldn't earmark budget money for the K gap year as we allocate money to say OPEP? No, that's exactly what the, that's my suggestion was in the first right. meeting. Right, and yeah. so I think that if, and I, I was I was going to say before, I've been looking at those revolving accounts with money in them, and that's not the only one, and I think some of the other ones got res resolved. So to see them go to a good use like this, I think is, is, is really good. But <coughs> if this is our plan moving forward, then why wouldn't we budget for it starting FY21 the same way when we knew we were going to adopt a new math program that we would put that in the budget? But we can't. We can't. We can't commit. No, no, no. I'm just saying we start. 
we've got that money this year, we put it someplace, we come up, you know, every year we talk about budget priorities. Right. The superintendent talks about the budget drivers. And again, this is this is a program. We, so we then you guys can need to keep it on front and center this time next year as a budget priority for FY21, right? So is that what you're saying, really, that, that we would put 200,000, and Kathy, I just want to make sure that that's your thinking. So between at least and Kathy, so you'd say we would take 200 of that 300,000 mm -hmm. and basically put it in the vehicle that we talked about from the auditors, mm -hmm. which would be that K line now, mm -hmm. and have that $200,000 sit there mm -hmm. and take that other $100,000 and ultimately put it towards um, something else. Something maybe. else or, or maybe in a stabilization. I mean, we've already put in $100,000 in OPEB in this budget, correct? Right. Mm -hmm. So you've got another 100000 There are other priorities. We have nothing in our stabilization accounts for the rug, right? For the, oh, for the field, the track and field? No, we've got, we've got money in there. We've got money in there. Well, if there, if there are other priorities to look at, yeah, to, to move it around, but... And then save the towns a little bit? Oh, you mean take out a smaller um, bond? Yeah. Low. I'm going to go back to though. Uh, uh, just should keep us in mind. Uh, keep in mind though. And, and to your point, next year we would have to have this discussion again. Mm -hmm. But what what I'm sensing though is that there's not a commitment right now on a time frame. Is that what I'm picking up or no? I mean, I, for, I think for me, I, I was intending at that with with my quick math off the top of my head, four years. If right. we start with 200 this year, 100 into FY20. And then, that, you know, because then that gives us the four years to get the extra 400000 Okay. And as much as I would prefer to see it in two or three, I just don't, I would feel fiscally irresponsible. It's a tough, it, this is tough. This is, uh, this is tough discussion. But I appreciate the richness of the discussion tonight. I think tonight. this is, I don't know that this is, I mean, this is, it has to be had. I think we've come light years to get to this point. Like, we're finally talking about this. I mean, it's. Yeah, Mike. When we set that money aside, so we set 200 um, towards the program and then 100 towards whatever else we decide. That money, if there's this feeling or this fear that we might say, well, we take it back. Or we're not really interested. How secure is that money when we take that 200? It's, and we it's not. Your money. It's not. So it's not because it'll sit in a revolving fund. I was just going right. to say, could we put it into a stabilization fund so it's dedicated and there is there's no take backs. Well, that's something that we'd, we'd have that discussion as well. Is that a possibility for us to establish a stabilization fund? Yes, that is that is a possibility. Go ahead and do it. I mean, I, I if you if it makes everybody, it might just give everybody comfort. It, it, yeah, it's, it's almost just for I, a sense of security that, that that money is not going to be yeah, taken yeah. and say, well, actually this came up. Right. If it's dedicated, it's dedicated. Then in that case, how do you feel about Elise's um, proposal? Well, I'm not going to say well, that. Because if it fails, it's going to make you look <laughs> feel bad. Um, how do you feel about? I'm not wedded to it. Two hundred, and then a hundred into OPEB or something else. I'm. Are you asking me or everyone? I'm asking you. <coughs> I like that. I would yeah. do that. I would, since we've had money budgeted for OPEB, I would look at some of the other, maybe the other stabilization funds that we've established, and and look at that um, other hundred thousand dollars for that. Or we might want to just hang on to that hundred thousand right now, because in light, I'm just thinking because of the SOI feasibility study, do we do we not do anything? Just leave it sit where it is right now. I I like the idea of moving the two hundred into stabilization or whatever. I think that that's a good good approach. So Wait a minute, Kathy. I'm going to go over here and then I'll come back. Okay. Um. <laughs> You know, my, my, my song is, is, is it's OPEC for, for $43 million, and we've probably got less than a hundred, less than half a million dollars in there right now, okay? Um, we know that in, what was it, recently, within the last year, the state changed the rules, or the accounting people changed the rules on how we have to deal with OPEC. There's no, there's nothing that says they're not going to change it. How did you we have to be really, we, they could really slam us on that. I think the other thing, Steve, is, million I think the other thing is, and I'm, I'm not banging the drum, but our towns, our member towns, they have the same problem. Are well funded with OPEP because they made the commitments. 
They all three of them made the commitment and Lancaster got to where they got to because they could, they got a big chunk of money and they plopped it into retiree health so they don't have to freak about it all the time. I uh, I heard a story today where some town announced that they were fully funded. Lemonster. Yep. That was Lancaster? Lemonster. Lemonster. Oh, Lemonster, yes. Yep. Lemonster is fully, their OPEB fund is fully funded. <clears throat> But their liability is like nine, I mean, it's all millions, but it's not 42, it was more like nine, but you know, but they are. It's relative, so okay, so let's go back to the discussion at hand. Thank you for that, because everybody else can me. If we were going to create a stabilization fund for our uh, kindergarten gap year, wouldn't we have to, would that have to be approved at town meeting? I think we did that last year. We had two stabilization funds Approved. Yeah, but we but do we need to really get into the minutia of that? I think we, like like for this meeting, let's just decide: Do you want to put a chunk of money into a stabilization fund and then we give it we, to the administration yeah, then we'll to work through? Okay. With it then they'll we'll come back to it. us and we'll yeah. do the minutia on that. So we right have now, a motion in the second. I think you don't have a motion. You have she, an idea. No, she. Oh, she, did she move? Kathy, 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 Kathy did. One hundred, two hundred. Motion. Okay, so the so the motion is two hundred and two a stabilization fund for full day K and a hundred to OPEP. Mm -hmm. That's, That's what okay. she said. The original yeah. motion was to allocate a hundred thousand to fund the OPEP and two hundred thousand to fund kindergarten out of the FY twenty budget. And that and that was seconded. That's I seconded. Yeah, wait, wait, wait. No, not out of FY twenty. No. no. Not of a budget. That's that's no, the, that's the three thousand. No, 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 that's within the budget now. It's the right. three hundred thousand. Yeah, right. So that's, we're not adding to the budget at all. If it's I can get behind, but I, I I'm, I'm on board. What? It's not even budget. I I, I, I know it's like not. But I, mean, I would rather because of the optics of oh, it and the amount of money part of it. I mean, I would rather we did a hundred to OPEB, a hundred to the leach field, and a hundred to K, because that leach field at, at half a million dollars is going to hurt a lot of towns, and they're going to take a vote on it, and nobody's going to say no. But we have that, and we have the, the uh, oil thing coming up, and, and the high school's right around the corner. That's gonna hurt. Oh my God, Lynn Paletti just said she would put money towards free day K. A third of it. Well, any, but the any. Of it is, <laughs> well, Good yeah, job. Well, there's two sides of it. Yeah, it's, well, don't we have to vote on this motion first? Yeah, we do, but we can have the discussion now before we do. Right. Um, all motions. right. So this motion doesn't include anything in the FY20. But it's correct? just the three. Just the three. We're just after right, three but then we would potentially have a second discussion about at whether we're including anything in the fund budget because that was also something that we sort of talked about. What? No, we're talking about F. We're talking about FY20. Right. No. No. Yes. She wants. Yes, we are. What are you? What? No, there's confusion because the money that is in the revolving accounts is the three hundred thousand dollars that we're talking about. That money is in. The budget, but not in the new FY20 budget. But it would be allocated through the FY20 budget. I guess. Mm -hmm. but it would not, not increase. It would not increase the budget. It won't. It yeah. won't. It doesn't impact it doesn't, the budget. Doesn't impact either. the budget at all. So it's two separate yeah. conversations. It's yeah, like, what do we want to do with this three hundred thousand? <clears> and then. Are you that's already that? there, and then are we? Are you going to allocate anything? Right? Oh or no, I just want no, I can't get behind another increase. Another. Well, that's fine, but that's yeah. a, a different discussion. Okay. All right. Right. So. Woo! I want. That's why I wanted to make sure what we're voting. People aren't like, wait, am I voting on? An additional the budget, or this is revolving. No, this is just for this. Just revolving. <laughs> okay. How do? You, okay. <laughs> so, is everybody ready to vote? What is the motion? The motion is two hundred thousand dollars of the existing budget. Revolving accounts. Revolving accounts. Yeah. Don't put any number in. Uh, don't don't it's put any year in there, Alita. Isn't that the existing budget? No, it's no. this is money they have has been sitting there for years. Revolving. It's it, but it's in. It's not in. It's no. It's in a pot. It's it's sitting in a bank somewhere. Yeah. Oh, you yeah. there we have it. It's in a That's why it looks bad. It's the pocket. All right, so the motion is to Thanks, Alita. allocate $100,000 from revolving accounts to, the, to fund the OPEB and 200000 out of revolving funds to fund to uh, fund full-day kindergarten. And a stabilization fund. 
Well, you got to vote on that separate to set up a stabilization fund. Okay. Are we good? Oh, I'm scared. So is that those motion, right? All, yeah. That's the motion. Yep. All those in favor? All those opposed? Lynn, the motion passes. Okay. Good, good job. Stabilization so, so now we vote yeah. to make a motion to set to, up a stabilization. Okay. Right. I'll move that. I move that <laughs> we make set it, up make a stabilization <laughs> fund uh, for funding full day pay. Second. All those in favor? All those opposed? Motion passes, Lynn opposed. Now, you're going to hate me. Never. No way. No way. Uh, if we're committing to full day K and we're saying we're going to put $200,000 in, we have to have the conversation about whether we're going to commit to any money in FY20 to put into the, that in the budget. That's correct. In the budget. Yes. And I would say that we should. Okay, make a motion. Make a motion. Oh my God. I move. I don't know. Do you, you just want me to be as as Well, the punch is on everything. It's all right. It's all right. It's all right. It's all right. She's um, going to move. Just let her make her motion. I move that we put $100,000 into full day K in the FY20 budget to go into the soon to be created stabilization fund. Do you want a second? Second. Steve, um, any comments, questions? Kathy? If we are going to add any money from this budget, it should come, my opinion is that it should come from any additional uh, reductions that we make. So when we continue on our discussion, if there are further reductions, no matter what that amount is, then it would be my idea, my thought, that that would be the amount that we would add to that from this budget. Okay. So the bottom line stays the same. Caitlin? In the beginning of the conversation, you folks said that she had to reduce the budget because she was working on reducing the budget by $100,000. And we just added another $100,000. Good job would be incredibly difficult. Sorry. It, what would be your recommendation? Um, <laughs> um, Steve, you want to take that one? Yeah, I'll take that one. Okay. Um, I'm going to move that we add $100,000 to the stabilization fund. Okay. And I'm going to move that we add $100,000 to the stabilization fund. Now, again, I, you know, I was going to say, at the end of the day, my job is to do what you tell me to do in terms of this kind of thing. If you tell me that it's 50000 or 100000 or 10000 or whatever, then we've got to go back and we have to figure that out. Our job is to, to figure that out, how that comes to be. Is it going to be a challenge? Yes, it is. Um, but that's my job. So, I mean, to, but I will also say, I thought all along, although we don't have anything in the budget line, that... If we're going to get to the 600000 at some point in time, if it's not this year, next year, you're going to have to. Like, that's why I went back after your point. So how many how many years are you going to play this out? Because at some point in time, that, and that's why I said, do you have a time frame on this? Because you're going to have to back it up and say, back into that date and say, okay, we need 200000 a year for the next couple of years, or 100000 a year, or 50000 over six, or what is it that you want? Because the three hundred thousand was half. Now you've now, as a result of tonight, you've take, taken that to two hundred. That means it's going to be four hundred thousand. So now you have, like, you know that that's what the game is. Like the four hundred thousand has to be allocated in some form or another through your your regular appropriations now over how many years. So I mean, that's where you're sitting at now. Somebody Whatever else raised like their hand. I don't remember who it was. Mike. Well. I know that it's 808, but we still have further discussions about the budget. Yeah, we do. Right. Yeah, so we do. that could answer some of our questions. So there's a motion on the floor. Um, to allocate $100,000 of the FY20 budget to be put into the stabilization fund for full day. All those in favor? Elise, Mike, Elaine, Steve. All those opposed? The motion passed. Oh boy. So how's that going to cut into the services? It passed. It passed for current services. Okay, we're moving on, guys, because uh, that's over and done with. Um, let's talk about the FY20 budget. And um, <clears throat> a couple of things I want to address. One is um, we're going to ask 
um, superintendent talk about the unit students, but I want to get to this quicker rather than not out of respect for folks who are here. Um, we received a question on the, uh, <coughs> the legal line item. And uh, Pat, can you remind me what is, what is our legal allocation? Is it 150 this year? I think it's 100. It's up to 100. So, so I think it was 60 last year, wasn't it? For this, the current cycle was that could be. I have to go back and look at. Um, and I think it's important that the you know uh, we don't need to get into it now, but the superintendent can speak to what the typical legal fees are in a district. You know, I mean, there's almost daily a lot of different things that are. Um, but our legal line item has gone up over the past couple of years. And if you have been looking at our agendas, you will see that our legal line item has gone up. Um, in, in, a, in a discussion um, earlier today, I had uh, received some advice on um, the fact that of all the different legal expenses that a district can face, litigation is by far the most expensive, it's the most um, intensive. And if you've been looking at our district, at our school committee agendas over the past two years, you will see a trend. Um, we have had more um, litigation brought against the school district, generally by the same person. So when you look at our agendas and you see executive session, and it says, for instance, um, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the litigating position of the public body, we have to name the person who's taken litigation against the district. That person's name is on here. That person's name's been on several of them. We don't know how much and when the district is going to find itself in this situation. What I can tell you is that for, and I wanna make sure I get this right because I wanna make sure the advice I got I'm following. Um, um, we have a former employee who's been very active. Today, the former employee has filed in Worcester Superior Court. All of those documents are public documents. You can go and find all of those documents. And to date, the court has determined that the district has done nothing wrong. And in fact, they said that the district has acted in good faith, which is quite the compliment. So I think I don't have the total dollar amount of the series um, within this this particular litigation, but if you so needed it or wanted it, you could certainly ask for that and do it through a public records request with the administration. Um, and at this point, there is additional litigation, and we can't really talk about the details. But at, I just want you to know that if you follow our school committee agendas, you will see a consistent thread. And the district has not done anything wrong. And in fact, the courts have supported the district and said that we or the district has acted in good faith. So I appreciate the question. Um, it's something that we have to deal with. I would say too, beyond that, like that that's a, probably one of the biggest chunks of our legal costs is that particular situation that has been ongoing. And if you take a look at tonight's agenda, you'll see that it's on there again tonight. So, um, I'm, but that's, that's part of our life uh, as a school district because um, you have some, things like that happen on occasion. It, it, it's not a regular thing, but it does happen on occasion. Other than that, um, you've got other costs, like regular costs, that things happen in 
you know, I don't want to say anything in detail because it's going to be it's going to breach confidentiality of children, and so I, I, I can't even give you examples. But I would tell you that probably about every, I bet you every third day something comes up that we have to seek legal counsel on, um, and it's not even just the obvious. To be honest with you, it's not even the. Um, we, we we have things like. Um, families, uh, you know, that are involved in the courts or DCF and all that kind of stuff. That kind of thing happens a, on a regular basis with us too. But we have more unique situations that, that arise and we never make a move unless we have our legal counsel tell us what that looks like. Um, but that isn't the bulk of our, the bulk of the legal costs right now are really attributed to the ongoing litigation with this one individual. Okay, moving on. Moving on. Um, so I, I, I don't know, Alita, if we can bring up, um, and Pat, we'll just quickly talk through where we sit tonight, and we're going to go through this quickly. I know it's getting late, and we've got two executive sessions left uh, to get through. <coughs> but I think we'll just kind of go through uh, and, and really hit, I'm not going to review January or the February 13th. You can bring it up just incredibly quickly for the sake of refreshing. Yeah. <laughs> Just for the sake it's, of it's refreshing. It's tonight. It's tonight. It's That's well refreshing done. Well the, played, uh, by the way. Well played. The last project, I think it is. Refreshing the memory. Uh, there we go. And, and, and here's the February 27th. Uh, now, one of the things I want to point out, when it says other staff efficiencies, sometimes I want to be really clear on what that that is because so, I think I don't want people to think, oh, they've cut staff. That's not what it is. For example, it could be things like we found out that our insurance will not be uh, cost us nearly as much, or in this case, like the dental health plan it won't cost us nearly as much. Those are all attributed to staff. So when we talk about staff efficiencies, I want you to think broader than, oh, are those bodies? They're not bodies, okay? Um, so that's that's kind of if you go to the next page, Alita, please. That's where um, that's where we were at, and we should have one more page, I think. There we are. So that's where we're at tonight. Uh, the 4.99% uh, for both and the 3.31 the stow is the uh, 0.01. Um, and you heard me say tonight, and, and to exactly to Chairman Moscow's point, um, I still have 100,000 that I'm looking at having to cut. Um, now I have 200,000. Yep. And so that, that puts me in a little bit different, different spot. Um, I know that we kept that third position in there, the Dean of Students, but quite frankly, that's probably the position that will be cut tomorrow morning because we just can't carry it. So that's pretty, uh, pretty much a short, short answer to a, a, you know, a long, I'm sorry you had to wait so long for that answer this <laughs> evening, but that's probably the position that's going to be cut. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Oh, come back again. <laughs> um, and, and in all fairness, Principal Dean Domenico and I have had this communication. This is not a surprise to him. Um, we, we, you know, we, we knew, but we get to a point in our uh, in our budget process, especially leading up to school committee meetings, where we have to cut it off. Like we we don't work on uh, you know still cutting things until tonight, like at five o'clock. We cut it off around Thursday before, so that by Friday we know what we're doing and we can do everything and, and generate that out. Um, with that said, though, we already are talking and saying, okay, what are the next the next cuts going to be? But we don't make any changes for tonight. What you see is what you get tonight. Um, but tomorrow morning, we will start again after the two, next two hundred thousand, and that first hundred thousand will be that dean of students. So, uh, so what we will have to deal with now tomorrow is another hundred thousand and figure out where that's going. So what that's, else? that's 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 what, quick. What other questions or concerns in the budget do you guys have? Yeah, I had questions about staffing. Like I'm sitting in your lap. lap. Sorry. Not yet. Um, <laughs> let you know. Um, working off the document that was getting out the last meeting in terms of the staffing requests, mm -hmm. and then also looking at the document that you sent out about class sizes and indicating. Mm -hmm. Um, those with 12 and under, 13 to 20, 21 to 25, and then 26 and over. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple questions. There are 11 physical education classes that have 12 and under. Um, 
Are any of those adaptive physical education? Would that explain the low numbers? Yes, and actually that's a, one of the reasons Principal D. Domenico is here right through tonight in case you have those kinds of questions. And some I'll be able to answer, others you'll be able to. But the answer is yes to that. Okay. And the other thing I would mention too is, is that sometimes in a cycle, um, um, when you're moving from one cycle to the next, you can't get all of your students in one class and that will spill over and sometimes that goes into a smaller sure. class. Sure. So I just want to make sure that when we look at that, it's not just, oh my gosh, we've got all these classes with like less than, there, some of them are purposeful. Other areas where they, that, that hasn't been, we've been dealing with as you well know. So. The other question I had, and I, I, don't, I don't know if it was something that you had projected up earlier, but in addition to the assistant um, principal, dean of students, at the high school, there was an additional science teacher. Is that correct? That's right. That's still that's still on there right okay. now. Okay. So under foreign language, you have 13 classes with 26 students and over. And of the um, the core academic areas, uh, that's the largest. And there was a quest, request for a 0.6 Spanish teacher. So I'm curious as to why foreign language has that. Uh, many um, kids, of, yeah. kids in the in those classes, and why wouldn't you be adding the point six Spanish? Uh, let me take a stab at this, please. I think that we we've had this conversation already, and we've had some staffing changes that we think will remediate that. Okay, is that a politically correct way of saying that? Well, will those numbers come down? You'll see. Ch I think you'll see some changes that, with that next year. Let, so, but let me just be obnoxious about it. Are we I'm gonna really want to be careful because this is personal. I, I, I don't care. No, no, okay. I'm not asking you for that. <laughs> okay. 26 kids, 13 sections of 26 kids in a foreign language is excessive. So you might have a little bit, but can you say your aim is for 20 kids in a foreign language class? I mean, I, what's I, the problem? You're looking like, uh, Elaine, what's wrong? No, I'm doing the math in my head. Ah. That's what I look like. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, she looks like she's in pain. <laughs> I don't know that we can ever say that we can hit that type of a number because it really depends on the number of kids enrolled in courses from one semester to the next. So I don't. I think that that would be foolhardy for us to say. Is this a trend or is this an anomaly? Well, it's a result in part uh, of both programmatic and staffing changes that occurred at the end of last year, uh, and you know, moving forward, it's hard to. It, really can't answer that question. We've got to look at what the student sign-ups are. We're in the middle of that right now. So uh, you know, midway through midway through March, uh, we'll have an idea of what those numbers are. But um, you know, at the end of at the end of last year, as you recall, um, we began to phase out uh, the very low enrollment in our in our Latin program, and uh, there was also a Spanish teacher um, who uh, left uh, and was not replaced. So. Those, those two those two things so so this is where it stands now in March of uh, 2019 and so when after usually October 1st when the dust settles we'll see a, another you could see another iteration yeah, of that point could, time no, it's just unusual I mean it used to be that uh, math and English had those high numbers um, science has um, uh, 29 sections with between 21 and 25 and um, I know that the science teachers like to especially for the lab sciences and, and I don't know if that's the case there are lab sciences that have 25 kids in them I, I don't that's know. that's that's a, the, the top number that we want to enroll in a lab science class uh, would be 25 right right but uh, in terms of the lab setups I mean, what are the, so you would have um, six tables with four kids, the lab tables, unless they, they're doing something different now. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure I can do that math with you right now, Kathy. Well, no, no, I'm just, I'm just trying to work it in my share. head. That's, that's, the, yeah. that's the, the, you know, the, the top. But it's a, it's a concern that the foreign languages, but if it's a result mm -hmm. of, under, so you don't feel the need to add a staff member then for foreign language, what happened to that point six? Well, I, I think as, as Superintendent Clenchy said, you know we're working on that, and it's it's hard uh, it's hard to stay with any certainty. But I think as she as she diplomatically said earlier, you know there are some uh, uh, some 
things, some wheels that are in motion. I mean, that's that's a concern. I mean, certainly, I, will, I won't sit here and say it's not something I want to watch, and I want to bring that number down. I think what we've tried to do is get, uh, over the past year, we've been successful in getting, moving more classes towards that sweet spot, uh, <coughs> you know, 21 to mid to low 20s. Um, and that's, that's what we'll continue to kind of keep our eye on. Okay, thank you. And then the last thing, um, I just want to advocate for keeping the point four admin for the Hale Middle School. That's still on right now. <coughs> it's still tonight. Do you have some feelings on that? I have some feelings. <laughs> I don't know. If she had a face too. Well, Everybody's got faces tonight. We all have faces. If you look at parity, and I think that we, and I, and I agree with the changes that were made. Um, at um, the Burbank, <coughs> and it gets to a point where the issues, it, it, you know, there are X number of kids that you have, the issues are the same. You still need help with the supervision evaluation. evaluation process. You have a child that needs a lot of attention and you don't have an assistant. And the other thing is that um, the principal, I think, is this his third year? I think the first two second. years, second year. Second year. No. It's only been right? two years. Yeah. It's too much yeah. um, But he would come forward and say, you know, I'm a new guy, I don't know what I need, blah, blah, blah. Well, now um, he's telling us something um, that he needs, and we have added um, administrative support, certainly at the high school. I know they feel they're down one, but there are, we hired a assistant superintendent. We hired we have department chairs. Um, we have the K-12 curriculum people. Um, and before we knew we were going to have an assistant superintendent, we hired a curriculum person as an assistant at the high school. So there are all these layers. And there's only one school that doesn't have support. And it's point four. Mm -hmm. So I want to advocate strongly that that remain. And I think that's all I have. Can I yeah. Oh, please. So, so you're right. And the, the evaluation piece, supervision and evaluation piece. In fact, everything you said is exactly what he said to me uh, behind the scenes. These are my problem areas. That's why I actually put it back on. Because I think I took it off two meetings ago, but I put it back on. Um, I have a question that's unrelated to this, but related the, to an earlier part of the discussion that Steve brought up. The, um, the, the replacement carpet for the field. Has there been an allocation to that this year? Last year, you mean at the end of last year? For this budget this cycle? Yes, I believe so, yes. So in this planning right now, we are making a new allocation? Yes. What is it? I don't, I'm sorry, I didn't see I, it. Thank you, thank you for looking that up. Yes, yeah, so it would be the yeah. facilities line. Facilities, it's all the same. Yeah, we'll go into the stabilization yeah. plan. Um, in the meantime, thanks, Pat, for, it, for, it up. for looking that up, for poking that up. Um, Elaine, Elaine, Elise, I'm sorry. You know, it's late. I've been up since four. <laughs> she just said 50,000. Oh, good. That's great. Thank you. Well, you could say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, when that sucker comes due in a couple of years, it's not going to be a drop in the bucket. Let's talk about quality. <laughs> okay, Elise. Uh, ah. I just wanted to. Name. No, <laughs> no, no, that'll mess it up even more. No, I spent my whole childhood on a basketball team with an Alice and an Elaine and Alicia and an Elise. I oh, think see, the right you're used name to ever, it. So I'm used to it. <laughs> um, no, I just, just sort of as a, as an aside, just because we are talking about class sizes and the need to hire new people, et cetera, and, and, and obviously that discussion is, is happening now, but will continue to happen. And I get that class sizes are like the most visible thing that everybody freaks out about, but there's almost no research that class sizes matter at high school. Like obviously if there's 50 kids in a class, that starts to matter, but when people have actually looked at and done economic analysis at higher levels, like high school, it's one of the least efficient things that you can do to spend your money on just saying, well, if we put another body in a classroom, that's going to fix things. Get that, assuming that the classroom physical right. size yes. can accommodate. The physical and I think space. that's more the issue that we have. Yeah, is but the I just, physical you size. know, like 
and so I, I, whenever I hear these arbitrary, you know, not arbitrary, but like saying, well, can we get it all to 20 kids or, and not to pick on Kathy, but um, because there isn't a magic number. And sometimes it may be more efficient with our dollars to expand a class or, you know what I mean? Or to create more personalized learning opportunities instead of just putting another physical body in the classroom. And I just want us to sort of like keep those things in mind. So I think it's easy for people, we get emails from parents that are like, why are the classes so big? And you need to do something about that. And it's not always the right answer, necessarily. Except when. Except when there's a, you know, when obviously a, a physical space. <laughs> Well, and, and, and also it's it's dependent on the subject and the kids in the classroom right. and right the dynamics. Right. Yeah. Mike. So so two things. Uh, I'll speak to um, Elise's point. I'm on the opposite end of that, where this research that I've gotten into says that there's sort of a inverse U relationship, where there's if there's too few kids, there's not enough academic momentum, and if there's too many, <coughs> then it becomes unruly. So there is sort of a sweet spot at around. 21, 22, and anecdotally, I can say that for me, that's perfect. 20, 21, 22 is perfect. Which, but, but that's just me. What's that? Which, oh, for what age? Ninth through 12. Um, and then to Kathy's point, um, and, and Paul, you can correct me, at the high school, um, science, math, English, and world language are all leveled, honors accelerated, and college prep. Yeah, with AP, obviously. Okay, yeah. So it's, it is important, again, to Kathy's point, that we understand that some of the college prep classes have a lower limit. Is that right? So a lower, I don't know what the lower max number is at Michelle Well, Well, there's nothing in, there's nothing in print, Mike, but, but, but certainly when we're point. scheduling, we're trying to, you know, you're, you're scheduling those for, it might be two, three kids less than, you know, uh, an honors class. Or right, something. right. So when we look at numbers that are 12 and under, classes that are 12 and under, um, some of those class sizes are intentionally reduced right, yes. to the benefit of the kids. Yes. So in some ways it would be better to be able to, <coughs> to parse out which of these are intentionally lower and which of these are just underpopulated. Mm -hmm. I, I, no, I totally agree. And, and to that, to, to elaborate on that point a little bit, Mike, yes, several of those classes are, 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 are purposefully kept at a low, uh, um, low enrollment for the reasons you just mentioned. Others are, represent um, the pinnacle of that particular course of study. You know, so you might have a student who uh, chooses to stay, to stay enrolled in a course of study even when they don't have to meet requirements because they're saying, I love this. And we want to be able to offer those opportunities to kids to study whatever it is their passion is at, at that top level. All right. Where are we? Well, I think we're done yeah. with the budget now. Okay. <laughs> Let's I have one more start. question. I'm sorry. What's that? I'm sorry. I have one more question. Don't be I'm sorry. sorry. <laughs> like two weeks, I have to bring it up. Um, the leaching field oil tank financing we were going to do with a bond, a 10-year bond, right? That's what I'd like, I'd like you to do. Okay, so I'm just going to say it. Let me just get it all out, and then I'm sure you'll respond. <laughs> it seems to me that using money from um, to fund something like this, an unexpected cost like this, is Again, if I'm wrong, let me know. Uh, uh, an ideal uh, expense for E&D. Now, I know that you want to build E&D back up to a particular level. I think you said 2.5? No, I don't think that we said that. No. Wasn't that high? Okay. But okay. that's okay. Whatever it was. But from my perspective, we're, we're either building up E&D so that we can eventually spend and feel comfortable, or we're spending now on the things that we would have spent anyway and then building it up. So I guess my question is, why aren't we thinking about pulling from E&D to reduce that bond? That's something that you could sit, you can consider doing. Um, it all it always makes me. I think right now until we get off this E and D wheel that we're on right now for a budget where we're having to draw down money every year to put. Am I saying draw down? Draw out of E and D to put in our budget. Like right now, we've got I think seven hundred thousand right now. Uh, no, I'm happy, pretty quite positive that that's where we're at. E&D? Yeah. No, no, no. That we've taken from E&D to put in to help fund this year's budget. Remember, every year we're trying to right. get that down, right? And and I was hoping, how much is it? 700. 700, that's what I thought. <coughs> and, you know, we were hoping in a three to five year period we could be down to zero or close to zero, maybe only doing it 200,000 or something like that. 
it's frustrating for me because we started, you know, we were hoping we could even be less than the 700,000 this year, but it just, it's not, it's just not going to happen. Until we get off that wheel, I am, I'm honestly not comfortable, right? I mean, that's something you could cer certainly consider, but right now I don't feel, I don't feel comfortable in doing that just yet. I mean, I, I certainly understand, and to your point, I, I want to be there, but right now we have to take part of that money to help keep that budget working every year. But I think I'm going to play devil's advocate on this. I think Mike's on to something because that is what E&D is for, right? Is extraordinary, unexpected. Oh, I'm not disagreeing. No, 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 no. I know, I know you're not, but I, but. <coughs> but keep in mind that you're already down 700000 mm -hmm. from that account. Yeah. I know. Right, I, right right I totally gates. get it. But I think, Mike, you're thinking, I think we're in a wicked, weird situation now. If we weren't in this horrible situation, I'd be with you going, but just why are we doing this? Let's yeah. just pay it. But we we do need some cash reserves. <clears throat> and, and, you know, and he, I guess from my end, well, this is going to sound Pollyanna, so just bear with me. From my lens, I know that we're looking at taking this out over the 10 year period, but certainly Pat and I have said, look, can we get this, can we take out this loan and pay it down faster? Do you know what I mean? Um, so if we think like like you're thinking, in another two years or three years, if we've got the, what we're drawing out of that D&D and putting into the budget every year, if we've got that down to the 300 mark, I'm not even gonna blink if there's still like 1.2 million sitting in that account. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And then we could then we look and say, you know what, we can now pay this off. We'll be stabilized enough and I'll feel very comfortable. I'm just not comfortable right now, but I'm just, again, it's your decision, but I would tell you, you always have to keep that in the back of your mind. But would you do that for the others? Like, we're still paying off the field, we're still paying off the capital expense for the high school, we're still paying off the, I mean, we still have a lot of capital expenses at the high school. Or look at paying off the higher well, so I mean, interest rate. I, I understand what you're saying, well, but yeah. to put it that way, I mean, it, why would you pay that one up first? <coughs> no, you, no, you're absolutely, no. But that, again, that's, and that's not a work thing, that's not a superintendent thing, that that's just a decision for the yeah. school committee. But it goes back to the point, the, and, and exactly what Trevor Morosco just said. But, it, know. but they need to know that, I mean, were we going to get a list of all the capital expenses that we're paying at one point? Because we still have a lot of bonds we, out there. The towns pay the capital expenses on the buildings, uh, except for the high school. It's at the high school. It's at the high school, but we give you that regularly. We tell you that yeah. almost every month. All right, I have a question for you guys. <coughs> the next thing on the agenda, given the fact that we have two executive sessions tonight, how do you feel about moving the um, school year calendar discussion to the next meeting? Are you okay with that? I am. How much do you have next meeting? Thank you. I think we're okay for the I next meeting. I think one. we should be fine. Yeah, I think the budget is too much on that topic. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So, because I've, we've gotten so many emails about it, can we put forth questions? I've, I've sent them all to you. Lorraine, everyone I've gotten. Five. Yeah, and Alita has everything. Yeah, um, I've, been, I've gotten ones just directly to Yes, me you have. Lorraine. Yes, um, you have. Because there are a couple questions that like, I would like to just have somebody answer just so I can sure. vote <laughs> next meeting. Oh, so. Quite, so can we like, funnel them to you and to. Sure. Talk? Just people that have asked me and I don't. What are the answer. questions? Maybe we can do this. Um, in particular, I've heard from a few teachers who have said that this wasn't something they wanted necessarily. Um, very few, like one or two. Um, but one in particular, you know, and, and a teacher who is a teacher at the high school who said, oh, you know what, a lot of the high school teachers wouldn't like this, um, switching to the Wednesdays. And so I just want to get a sense for, you know, but then I've also heard from other teachers that like, yes, we do want, you know, so like, <laughs> And I know that's going to be like that with everybody. You know, there's always going to be people who are for and against. There's always going to be parents that are fine with it and parents that aren't. Um, but I just wanted a sense for, you know, is this something that sort of is coming from mostly the elementary school teachers and the middle school and the high school less so? Is it kind of been a plurality that there's most teachers are into it? That's, that's, yeah, that, that's probably more an Anne Marie thing. Well, she's on fire. That Lisi over there, she's moving and shaking. You yeah. might be responsive. I'm impressive with you. I'm impressive with you. I'm tired. I'm impressed. The, uh, the makeup. Yeah. The, 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 the we've got five uh, educators on the committee, and we've got three parents, and then we've got um, four or five administrators. And the theory is that each of those people would come to the meeting 
with the with the thoughts of their constituents, you know, um, bring forward the thoughts of their constituents. So really, they're representatives of the people that they talk to. So we can only assume, you know, that <coughs> right. what we're hearing, you know, is uh, is representative. But, but you know, right. getting lots of angry emails from teachers being like, "What?" No, yeah, we haven't gotten any. Not no, any and like I said, it's been only a couple of people, and so I couldn't tell because it's almost split 50-50. It's like, yeah. and you almost have to keep in mind we have what six hundred employees. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. yeah, and so everybody's gonna have a slightly different. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, okay. so Kathy's, Kathy's going to assume here. Yep. So um, we will vote on the school calendar, but we'll bring forward questions that um, through Lorraine that Brooke yeah, can we answer and Anne Marie can answer. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Thank you very much. The only subcommittee report is for budget and warrant. Did not meet. <gasps> did not then there today. was no report. <laughs> very good. Okay. Um, the consent agenda, does any? Anybody have any additions, corrections? And the warrants went around. Did everyone have an opportunity to sign? Steve, do you need these? No. <coughs> okay. So then the items to be Thank considered you. for the next agenda, we added a um, evaluation workshop from 5 to 6 on 327. From March 13th, we added the vote on the Calendar. Was there anything else? Um, no, that's the only thing on the planning calendar. Okay. It's just that in the budget. Okay, final because final you have to take final vote. Oh, yes. Okay, yeah. All right. So then we have. Okay, so we need to. Um, Make them. Uh, I'm not sure how this works. Um, we need to make a motion. Have a motion to um, go into executive session. To go into executive session. So, and who's going to be included that's, in? That's not the one. I think that there's another the sheet here. Right. Of here it is. Okay. So the people that are included. Yes. Okay. So Lynn, would you? Make the motion. Move to go into executive session at 8.40 p.m. pursuant to MGL C30A 21A3 to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigating position of the public body and the chair so declares. Specifically, the litigation matter of George P. King Jr. versus Patricia Marone. Docket number 1885CB00643. And pursuant to MGL C3A section 21A3 to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigation position of the public body in the Chia Soda Clear's Unit C Evaluation Tool Review, Executive Session to include Superintendent Clenchy, Assistant Superintendent McGuire, Business Manager Pat Marone, and Director of Human Resources in Marie Stoica. The committee will adjourn, adjourn in executive session. Okay, can I have a second? Second. Have a roll call? Do I do the roll Yes, you do. Do you do the roll call? Yes. Elaine? Yes. Steve? Yes. Kathy? Yes. Lynn? Yes. Elise? Yes. And Mike? Yes. Okay. That's it. Thank That's you. It. Good night.